Good evening, Mount Vernon. Welcome to the March 15th Mount Vernon City School District School Board meeting. Please stand for the pledge. Trustee Miller? No. It's mandatory. Present. <laughs> Trustee Saunders? Present. Trustee White? Present. Trustee McGowan? Present. Trustee Patterson? Present. Trustee Mitchell? Present. Trustee Turnquest? Present. Trustee Red? Present. Trustee Sorensen? Present. Quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have communications from the public. The Mount Vernon Board of Education recognizes the critical importance of community discourse and involvement in the education of Mount Vernon's children. And accordingly, members of the public are invited to speak at each regularly scheduled board meeting, subject to the terms of the board policy. A speaker must register in advance by no later than 4 p.m. the day of the meeting by contacting the district clerk in person, by phone, or by email. The board welcomes all respectful comment, whether praise or criticism. However, identifying and criticizing a specific student, parent, teacher, administrator, or other Mount Vernon education official or employee is strictly prohibited. Any such complaint must be presented and addressed through the proper administrative channels. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to speak. Up to one additional minute may be used for the speaker to summarize and conclude their remarks. If appropriate, board trustees and or the superintendent or other staff members at the direction of the superintendent may immediately respond to a speaker's remarks. First speaker is Ms. Cynthia Crenshaw. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Cynthia Crenshaw, 315 Monday Lane, Mount Vernon, New York. I have three items I would like to talk about. The first one is the charter school. We just found out about the charter school by on the paper. Now, I understand that you had a, a, um, calls going out to parents and citizens about the school, but a lot of people did not get this call. The concerned citizens went around and asked parents and teachers, did they get this call? Now, Mount Vernon is only four square miles. We feel we do not need another charter school taking $9.1 million from our public schools. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a renter. Nothing. I was a renter for years. But are these kids' parents, do they own or do they rent? Because if they own, okay, they're contributing to the taxes. If they are renters, then why not let the parents pay some of these fees? It is not fair. We need to keep our schools up. We have 16, I believe, public schools in Mount Vernon, and we do not need to be given $9.1 million to a charter school. Hell, Park, I'm sorry, Park would need a, um, some green space, and we're giving this money to the charter schools. It's not fair. And I would like to know if you can provide us with a date that these calls went out and who was present. I believe that that might be public information because you have to come up here and say your name and where are you from. And this group that was for it, it was those all the people that was for the charter schools. My second thing is, do you know they're putting up a cannabis in Mount Vernon? On 4th Avenue and 3rd Street, they're trying to put up, um, that would be a marijuana place that other cities can come and get, pick up their marijuana from. A couple of cities told them no, they did not want their in their city. Why is Mount Vernon a dumping ground for everything that goes on in Westchester County? It's not fair, and I would like for you, if you can, I go and talk before the city council. If you do not want to speak, 
if you would just call and say, I support Cynthia Crenshaw, the concerned citizens, you don't have to speak. Just say that. We will definitely appreciate it. This cannabis should not be right in the middle of 4th Avenue and 3rd Street. It's in between three schools. It's in between Parker, Armani, and Washington. Come on, Mount Vernon. We just cannot keep letting this take place in our city. It's not fair. We don't need another charter school. I understand that's already taken place, but we would like to know what is the procedure for that. How did that happen? Okay? The cannabis, we don't need that. And then they're also trying to put a group home, a boys' group home, in front of an elementary school, Grimes Elementary Schools. There's 53 homes in Mount Vernon for sale. Why would you want to put a boys' group home in front of an elementary school? Again, Southside again, Boys Club, Cannabis, and the Charter School, they won't tell us where, that, where that's going, so we don't know. So please, just support us. Like I said, when they had the city council meeting, I will be there. Just say, I'm going, I'm here to support Cynthia Crenshaw, concerned citizens, and you do not have to speak. If we could get your support, we would sincerely appreciate it. And to you, Dr. Hamilton, thank you for your support. And I guess you are leaving. This might be one of the reasons we have <laughs> this charter school that we're giving away $9.1 million. You can't do anything. You can't. It's, it's, it's just totally impossible. But Mount Vernon, let's get back. Let's get back to where Mount Vernon used to be. Let's save our loving city. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Crenshaw. Okay, next speaker. Shanice Brown. Shanice Brown. Okay. Omar McDowell. Shanice. It's been a while. It's good to see everyone. Understanding everything we've recently been through. It's good to see everybody face to face. But good evening to everyone. Can you raise that up? Good evening to everyone, to the superintendent, to the board, to the administration, to the community, the community that's watching online. Um, it saddens me to have to stand here to talk about this today. Welcome to the mic. It saddens me to sit here to try to talk about this today. I'm a strong supporter of the Mount Vernon City School District. I've sat where you sat. I understand the job that you have and how difficult it is in trying to balance everything that you have to balance. But at the same time, as a parent, there comes a time where you have to come up and stand up, not only for your children, but as a supporter of this city, I have to stand up and support the children that don't even belong to me. All right? I want to talk to you really briefly about culture, the importance of culture. Many of you understand that as professionals, you understand that any strong organization, in order for it to stand up, it must have strong culture. As a matter of fact, I understand that when we did the bond, we sold the bond on that very notion that we were not just going to beautify buildings, but we were going to bring back strong culture, that we was going to shift the thinking of our students, that we was going to try to shift the thinking of our teachers, of our staff members, to get them to see Mount Vernon differently. And the beautification of buildings was just going to be a small part of how we shifted that culture. I was about to say, say amen. <laughs> but how we shifted that culture. And sad to say, I have to stand here today that I believe that the Denzel Washington School of the Arts is not exhibiting that at the current moment. I believe that the culture is declining. And if interventions are not put in place, I believe the culture will move from declining to being toxic. I'm sad I have to say that. That if the culture does not shift from, the, from helping it from decline, that it will become toxic. I read a quote, and it said that a seed cannot grow in toxic soil. A vision cannot come forth. A dream cannot come forth. And when we set forth that restructuring plan, that's what we did. We set forth vision. And we said that it was going to be more than just about buildings and construction, but it was about shifting culture and giving our students the pride that they needed as they went off to college to ensure that they could be proud of where they came from and the schools that they came from. 
I'm proud to be in Mount Vernon. While I was not raised here and while I did not go to school here, I lived here for about 25 years now. I raised my children here. All three of my children went to school here. One is about to graduate, and she's doing an extremely fine job in school. So I'm not here to, 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 to discourage the school system. But I am here to say that I believe that the culture in Denzel Washington is shifting, and we need to put interventions in place in order to, be, to stop that slide. Why do I believe that? I believe that the culture is shifting is because when I listen to a parent meeting and I hear parents say that their children are intimidated and they're not talking about intimidated from students, I believe the culture needs to shift. When I hear parents say that their children are losing the morale because the school is not providing what they said they will provide, I believe that the culture needs to shift. When I have a principal that would dare to call a parent's boss and lie and I'm going to say this because it's my wife, and lie and say that my wife came to a meeting drunk or seen drunk. My wife is known by more than half the people in this community. And to even believe that my wife would come to a meeting, a parent meeting, drunk, is a bold-faced lie. Mm -hmm. That tells me that a culture needs to shift. When I hear parents frustrated, it tells me that culture needs to shift. I'm not here to get anyone in trouble. I'm not even here to try to get anyone fired. I'm here because I want the Board of Education to look into this. Why? So that we can provide interventions and that you can report back to the community and say what we're doing so that we can continue to move forward with the vision that was set forth back in 2015. The 2020 vision didn't stop in 2020. We have a, a, a responsibility. I knocked on hundreds of doors. Many of you were on the board when I was here. We knocked on hundreds of doors, and we talked to plenty of meetings. The superintendent had plenty of meetings all over this community, and we told them that this was not just about beautification, but it was about shifting lives and changing culture. I know my time is up, but I want to emphasize the fact that I'm asking you to do an investigation. I'm asking you to call a student body together and to talk to them. I'm asking you to do a survey with the st staff because staff are sometimes scared to talk about their bosses because that's the person I got to listen to. I'm asking you to do some type of survey so that they can express themselves. Why? Not to get anyone in trouble, so that we can understand what the issues is, are, and so that we can put interventions in place so that we can continue to fulfill the vision that we set forth in 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Next speaker is Rayanu Adams. Hello? Hi. Hello. You guys can hear me, right? Okay. Uh, good evening, school board and parents and members of our community. Um, I guess some context is Ms. Ms. Saunders came to our class and spoke to us the other day, and we brought up some issues, and she invited me to come to the school board and um, espouse them to you guys. Um, I guess uh, the two biggest issues... Um, that in my head I felt were problems were communication. Um, Miss Cynthia came up here and she gave me a great example when she said there's a charter school and they called and nobody got the call and nobody even knows this is happening. Um, I think the school board uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, a lot of times fails in getting the message out to the community and I think it also fails in having a united message at times where people want a direct um, idea of what's going to happen and sometimes one person is saying this and sometimes another person is saying this. Um, also going to schools, um, I was so happy to see Ms. Saunders in our classroom and being able to speak to her and she was personified and she became a face, not just an email on the school website. So having the board or People at these positions of powers visit our schools more often and see what's going on in person um, would be great. Um, and then an issue close to my heart personally is busing. Um, <laughs> I'm a student athlete. I run for Mount Vernon track team. And there is a bus that picks up all the other schools and takes them to the high to practice. It comes at 4 p.m. sharp every day. But what happens a lot is that students have to choose between their extracurriculars or their sports. 
And I think that it's an easy solution to just have another bus come at 5 p.m. Because it would allow kids to 5 p.m., 4 p.m., uh, I misspoke. Um, and it would allow students to do their clubs, which usually go from after school 2.50 to about 3.45, and join their sports, which practices start around 4 p.m. Um, and it's also a problem when you're not even just like joining a club or extracurriculars. If I have to stay after school for a test and I miss that bus, now I'm out of luck. I have to find my own way to Mount Vernon High School. So just adding a second bus um, that comes an hour after every day would be helpful. Um, and that was it for my large issues. I know my classmates um, brought up some issues to Ms. Saunders mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to be telling you guys about <laughs> today. Yeah. So, uh, so um, can you read my... What's, what's, sure. excuse me, what school, what school do you attend? Oh, yes. I, oh, I okay, forgot. Steve. Wait, I have, I have the shirt on today. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I have to do this one for them. Um, so, uh, I think I can go. So, school food. Um, we know that is not totally on the board because you guys, you know, you get contractors and stuff. But um, there's some inconsistency there. It's always very good at the beginning of the year, and then the quality tends to fall off mm -hmm. as they see that you guys, like, aren't watching anymore. You know, in the beginning, when you first get those contractors, they're trying to be as great as possible. Um, STEAM had a STEAM challenge day, um, Fridays before breaks, or I can't remember how they decided it. That was miss bradley's um idea that we would love to bring back and have students have a day to explore these stem ideas plus art of course um mental health days we had those last year during covid of course those wouldn't be able to be in the same capacity and having one day's off, wednesdays off but um you know a school yoga day a school talking about mental health having the teachers um just sit down and shift their focus for a day would be um, great. And then the last thing I wanted, I wanted to mention, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, uh, <laughs> um, is the quality of our teachers. Um, I want to say we do really have really good teachers in the Mount Vernon education system. They, they really do care about their students, and I just felt it would be wrong to not mention that uh, coming here today. And I would love you guys to, you know, just listen to them because they're great. They love us. They care about us. And sometimes it's hard to see that the board isn't fulfilling their needs. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope I have a little bit more time because uh, he didn't finish the, um, some of the stuff that they talked about. Um, they talked about... Um, the um, the traffic in front of the steam school going across the street how dangerous it is um, and I said that was a city health issue so I think that we need to reach out to to Mount Vernon school Mount Vernon the city of Mount Vernon to have them implement maybe a crossing guard across the street from the school and down the street by the uh, circle okay um, he talked about the drama club you know the lighting in the room is very dark. They said that he wants, um, Ray wants to learn um, how to cook. So they want to bring back home economics in that school because they want to stay in that school. So they want to have something to, um, they want to have something um, in that school. Also, the, uh, one of the students said that the uh, school, the, the milk, was the sale date was that day. So I don't know if uh, Trustee Mitchell will look into that. Um, and then the, um, some of the rooms are, this was room G3, correct? G3 gets very hot, G3 gets very cold, and then there's other rooms that, you know, you can cook an egg in it. So if somebody looks into that for facilities, we'd appreciate that. Okay, is that it, Mike? Understaffing? Wow, that's something that we, 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 we continually talk about. Okay. All right, so that's it for Ray. And I have something also to talk about for um, community, um, community comments. I also, I received an email from the, um, the Good Neighbors Block Association 
Miss um, Harris, and she talked about the charter school. She said, we, the members of the Good Neighbors Block Association, were not aware of the plan to place another charter school in this tiny, very densely populated city of Mount Vernon. According to the Express newspaper, the director received community support for a project that was not needed, nor can the city afford. Just another case of people from outside Mount Vernon coming in to tell us what's good for us. There are enough schools in our city trying to put out, trying to put a Band-Aid on a grappling hole may be a quick fix to help someone make money on the backs of the aged homeowners of the city. I've spoken to many people who, like myself, never heard of it and don't support it. I'm not sure what can be done at this point. If you as a board can think of anything or know any action that can be taken, please inform us. Also, were you aware of the impending danger and did not broadcast it to all of us who have to bear the burden of this along with our children and our, out, and our grandchildren who will be losing out on variable resources which are now have to go into pockets of outsiders. If these people really want to effective, if these people really want to be effective, then they should move to Mount Vernon, pay their fair share of tax, and um, improve our schools. Mary Harris. That's it. That concludes public comment. Can we uh, reply to? Should we reply to her? Can I reply? Sure. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, Ms. Crenshaw, can you hear me? OK, great. So uh, while you were talking, I started to do some research about uh, charter schools. I know some things about charter schools, but I started to do a little bit more research about charter schools. <clears throat> so uh, the charter schools are approved by SUNY Charter School Institute. Apparently, they are supposed to actually look at our district the current charter school that is coming in is going to be, quote unquote, a STEAM charter school. And we already have a STEAM school. So I'm not sure as to what SUNY Charter School Institute looked at to approve for this particular charter school that is coming to Mount Vernon to come here. That's number one. Uh, number two, the SUNY trustees are the individuals who we need to battle with. Uh, the SUNY trustees are appointed by the governor. There was a new governor right now, as we know of. And from my understanding, they are about, I, I'm not sure, Dr. Hamilton, they might be like about three charter schools applications that are put in right now on the table to open up in Mount Vernon. So now we have to be, uh, we have to uh, stay ready so we don't have to get ready. And um, so I'm looking for information on how to complain, who to go to, and, um, and how do we talk about, a, there, there's apparently a cap, like a charter school cap. Um, I can't read that fast. I can read, but I can't read that fast because I've been trying. I was hoping that the student would just stand up here and just continue talking while I was just reading all these different applications and, and articles in regards to that. But there is a cap. Uh, we also would need the, the union for teachers and administrators in Mount Vernon to also step up to the plate in regards to this because it affects our administrative staff, it affects our, our, um, our educated, uh, educational teams and, and our teachers. And so um, I want to thank you for, um, for coming up and stepping up. I will try to do the best that I can to, um, to follow up as well as um, come to a city hall uh, a meeting. Um, they, they already knew about this because they announced it as well. Ah, and so um, 
So, yeah, so we need to start sitting down at the table. Uh, here's my phone number. You ready? Yes. Area code 240-605-2477. I go to sleep early, Miss Crenshaw. Yeah. <laughs> so don't call me after 9 o'clock because I'm, I'm viable to say something crazy over the phone to you. But... Um, so we, we have to do this together. We have to try to dot our I's and cross our T's. Um, uh, Dr. Hamilton can do as much as he can. But once again, it's not the Mount Vernon City School District trustees that are in charge of charter schools. This comes from somebody else. But we need to start addressing the somebody else's who are the SUNY Board of Trustees. Currently, right now, I think that person is Merrill Tish. Um, and that, uh, yeah. That was like 2021, so this is 2022. So currently the person is Merrill Tish. And so we need to start getting our letter campaigns going on and mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, the understanding is, is that you are not just going to come here and suck out dry because that's what happens. Um, suck dry uh, what Mount Vernon has. I have not met a person yet from Mount Vernon who said that I had a terrible education in Mount Vernon. There's a lot of trustees that are on this uh, board right now who are products of Mount Vernon City School District. They did not say to me that they had a terrible education. And so when you see charter schools coming to black neighborhoods, and I'm going to stop because you know I could go crazy with it, right? So when you see charter schools come into a black neighborhood, charter schools come into black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They come to neighborhoods where it's 90%. Black, 90% low test scores, and 90% um, low income. But the test scores part is a part that y'all need to understand. Because in neighboring municipalities such as Scarsdale, and Hart uh, Scarsdale Hartsdale, Mamaronic, a lot of their children do not take the New York State exam. Right. Their parents opt out of taking the New York State exam. So the, the percentage looks off. It looks like as if they did an enormous, a really good job, right? And so it has you hoodwinked, led astray, and bamboozled that Mount Vernon School District is not doing well because they show those test scores, but they don't put in parentheses, please note that the municipalities their children are not taking the New York State exams. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of that. So 240-605-2477. Thank you. Um, just one second. I just want to uh, really quick address our wonderful STEAM student. And I, I'm sorry, it's Ray, right? Yes. Hi, Ray. <laughs> I'm, I'm Trustee Candace Camilo Sorensen. And I know that a lot of us want to be more visual. You know, but a lot of us also, you know, have a morning job. And um, for example, uh, I could talk about, you know, Miss um, Trustee Tarnquist Jones and myself, we're teachers. So the time that you are in school, we are, we are in classrooms ourselves. So I wish that we had more time for all of us to be present because we would love to, to see you more. We would love to speak to you more. And I couldn't agree with you more. Our teachers are the soldiers on our trenches. And we need to listen to them. We need, they're the ones who will tell us if we want this, this, our district to be better, those are the ones that we need to listen to. They are the ones who are going to tell us if the curriculum is working, if it's not, if we, what is it that they need. We need to provide them with the weapon that they need in order for us to win the war, <coughs> bottom line. So I agree with you 100%. Thank you so much for expressing yourself. And I would like to commend the young man for coming up and speaking about what is needed mm -hmm. at the STEAM program. Mm -hmm. So I commend you because a lot of students wouldn't do it. Yep. And to Cynthia, um, you know I support you. I'm going to be there, anything you need to know. And I'm sorry I didn't return your phone call, but I was busy. <laughs> but um, um, you have my support. And with Turnquist Jones, Ms. Turnquist Jones, we're going to get something going. Okay? 
Can I just add one thing? Just Ms. Crenshaw, we, we, we all agree with you, 100%, all of us. And just so the public's aware, I do know that Dr. Hamilton did give, because he's obligated as superintendent, to respond to the request for a charter school. And I know he personally made a whole presentation outlining all the reasons why they shouldn't agree to it and fighting very hard against it. And he, he was overruled by the state. Um, so we don't agree with that. We don't like that. Could we have done more? Yes. And I think when I say we, I mean the whole city. Because this has got to stop. It's got to stop. So I'm with you. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. All right. So we're moving on to the uh, superintendent's report. Good Does evening. that conclude public comment, right? Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Um, there we go. Uh, first of all, Ms. Crenshaw, thank you. As always, I appreciate your, your comments and your advocacy. Um, I, I do think that if the community is looking for a worthy cause to unite around, it's about charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, they are disproportionately placed in Mount Vernon. Uh, we do have some champions, um, Assemblyman Pretlow, Assemb uh, Congressman Bowman, um, Senator Biagi, Senator Bailey. I've spoken to all of them as recently as about two weeks ago. Uh, about this charter school issue. Um, they are very interested in hearing from constituents about this. There is power in numbers. Um, I've spoken to the commissioner. I've spoken to the governor's office. Um, and I do think that, quite frankly, part of my frustration, which I have expressed, is these public hearings where we come out and we oppose seems to carry no weight. So I think it's quite misleading to suggest that community members can come out and voice their opposition and somehow control the narrative. Mm. Um, but as voters, you do get to influence um, the people at the state level uh, when it comes to how decisions are made. So I would encourage the city to wrap their arms around our community, to wrap their arms around this, this uh, charter school um, <coughs> situation that seems to be, Mount Vernon seems to be prime for, for some reason. Um, so thank you for your, for your comments. Uh, Ray, thank you also for your commentary. I always love hearing for students, from students. Please make sure you reach out to uh, your school representatives who are on the superintendent's uh, student advisory council. They bring a lot of issues directly to the uh, meeting. Um, and they have a lot of influence. So please speak with um, Hilly Gonzalez is your representative and Ian, Ian, what's Ian's last name? Martin um, is also your student representative at uh, STEAM. So please talk to them and have them bring your issues or join the meeting um, and we can make sure that that information gets out to you. Uh, moving on directly to my report. Um, for your information, we have completed all the budget defense rounds finally. <laughs> Um, and we are ready to present our budget to the board. Principals and directors were asked to use their school or department specific data to develop their requests. Um, this data is not limited to student performance outcomes, although it is a big part of it, but also other building specific conditions that may require the application of principles of equity and how resources are allocated. Um, I do uh, know that there are quite a number of capital projects that are, have been requested by principals. Um, and I am strongly advocating that we allocate money in this budget cycle for capital projects. Uh, I know there's been talk about a bond for the BCS, Building Condition Survey. Um, I don't think my view, of course, and it's the board's prerogative, I do not think the climate is right to put out a bond, so I hope the board, uh, when they see, I know the budget committee met today and, and I haven't had a chance to um, speak with, with the budget committee, um, but I do hope that the board will receive our recommendation for some of the capital projects in lieu of a bond. Obviously, we'll never be able to address all of the capital projects in the general operating budget, um, but we have uh, put some items that I think are germane and important for our, our facilities. Um, and we'll also need some clarity on, as we finalize the budget, 
um, what is the board's desire relative to a tax increase or not. I know last budget cycle we talked about eventually uh, we need to start gradually showing a budget, a tax increase because uh, eventually there will be a spike at some point. However, um, circumstances change, situations change. We had an increase in state aid. Uh, we see, receive federal um, dollars, and we know what gas prices is doing to everybody right now. Um, so again, I defer to the budget committee because I don't know what they came out with, but I would recommend that we, the board not consider a tax increase this budget go around, but again, um, I serve at your pleasure and we'll do whatever is necessary. Um, we have developed the following schedule for public information so that the community members can one, be informed about the budget, but secondly, have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, we are also gonna ask, and I'll talk to Madam President and um, our Vice President about a special meeting next week just for the budget. So we have the opportunity to ask, you have the opportunity to ask questions and we can present. Um, and of course, we will be doing some budget presentations publicly. Um, we have scheduled March 30th at 6.30 p.m. Um, and we'll ask the board to adopt the budget at the Tuesday, April 5th meeting. Uh, we'll have a second public um, presentation on April 6th and a third on Saturday, April 23rd. Um, so this is an opportunity for um, folks to learn about the budget and be informed about um, what the administration is putting forward. Uh, you need to do this again? Sure. Can you, can you sure. just mention the times for the, for the uh, April, the two April? Uh, April 5th at 6th. The, they, these will be virtual. Okay, virtual. These will be virtual. We we find that um, our virtual meetings have gotten a lot more participants than mm. going out and doing the little cottage get-togethers. Um, so virtual at 6.30 p.m. on April 5th. And I'm sorry, that's the board adoption April 5th. The meeting would be Wednesday, April 6th at 6.30 and Saturday, April 23rd at 10 a.m. So we get folks who uh, schedule during the week may not um, be able to accommodate that. You got the first <coughs> time, okay. March 30th at 6.30, okay. Um, what did you say, March 30th at 6.30? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, you. You're welcome. Um, and I would also uh, just like to bring to your attention, I'm gonna ask Dr. Gorman to talk about this a little bit. Uh, standardized testing season is, up, is among, mm -hmm. upon us. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to be doing the grades three through eight assessment. Um, ELA will be March 29th, beginning March 29th through March 31st. And math will be April 26th through April 28th. And the regents will be June 15th through 23rd. And let me say this, because I talked to the kids about it because they were raising this as an issue and Dr. Gorman is gonna talk a little more about it. Um, the standardized tests does not provide uh, any indication whether or not students should be promoted or retained. And kids keep asking me that. Um, it is just a formative assessment. It just gives us information to inform instruction, inform curriculum. It is not a determining factor uh, in terms of student uh, placements for next year. We do not track our students. So it does not serve that purpose. It is a formative assessment Formative implies that it informs instruction, informs decisions. Um, I do want our students to just relax, take the tests, and do your best on it. Um, and of course, we want our children to perform well, but we don't want to put so much pressure on this assessment um, where children feel that it's about their promotion or retention. It does not have any impact on that at all. Dr. Gorman, I know you wanted to add some more commentary on that as well. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you. I just wanted to echo some of Dr. Hamilton's um, sentiments, and um, it is testing season. So it comes from the federal Every Student Succeeds Act, the ESSA, right? So that is the mandate of where this testing has to come from for states to test. Um, it's important that all of our students do take these exams. A few important talking points. Grade three to three 
to eight student tests are not on student transcripts or permanent records. So that's really important for students to know. As Dr. Hamilton said, it's a real good barometer for parents to learn about their children's academic achievement, where they are. It's important for teachers to understand how well their students are learning what is being taught. It's really important for school and district leaders to determine what is and what is not working well in the school district and what we can tweak and adjust to. And it's really important that all stakeholders to identify achievement gaps that may be forming among different student populations and subgroups. So those are all data points that are really important for us to look at. Um, students are not penalized in any way for these assessment results and they do not appear as grades on report cards or part of their marking period grades. So it's really important to stress to the kids that it has nothing to do with their academic grades or, or and will not be posted anywhere. Um, these test scores are not part of the teacher's APPR as well this year. That's the Annual Professional Performance Review. So there is not the, um, the, the a couple of years ago it was connected to teachers. So, right, so that was a highly um, political piece on, on accountability and whether teachers should be you know, capped or let go based off of test results of kids in their classroom. So that is not the case. Um, teachers are exposing students on what to expect with test-like questions, but we are not test prepping on a daily basis because that does not really work. Um, but they are being exposed to, kids are being exposed to what they will see, test-like questions and previous year's ex exam questions. Um, we want to reiterate to our students to take these assessments seriously but not to stress out overtaking the exams, as Dr. Hamilton mentioned. Um, the tests will continue to be untimed, and accommodations are made for special education students, according to their IEPs. Um, our staff is being trained on the administration of the assessments during faculty meetings, and several are allotting time tomorrow during our half-day superintendent's professional development day. So I know principals and administrators are working uh, with their staff tomorrow on this. Parents can help out by making sure the students um, get plenty of sleep the night before, they come to school on time, um, and that they're rested. They eat a nutritious breakfast either before or in the morning time when they get to here for breakfast. And, um, and remind your children not to rush, just try to find a pace and, and do the best that they can. Um, the other assessments like Dr. Hamilton mentioned, um, the, new, um, the new U.S. History and Government actually is being given on June 1st. The rest of the region's exams will be the week of the 15th in June and the subsequent week. There are no tests on Monday, June 20th, which is Juneteenth. And I know we're off from school, but there is no testing throughout the state on that day um, as the holiday is being observed federally. Um, and what we'll do is we will um, consolidate all the different memos we get from the state, and we'll put a nice, clean schedule up on our website in the next couple of days. Oh, thank you. And also, I'm sorry, go ahead, trustee. If you want to finish, you can. I can ask my question. No, no, I'm good. I was getting ready to move on to another topic. Okay. So one of the things you mentioned, Dr. Gorman, was that test scores are not part of a teacher's APPR now. Is that going to change at some point? They were previously. Um, or this year? It's not for this year at all. Actually, the other, APP, the other half of the APPR is on teacher grades of students. Um, which is not connected, which is not connected to test scores. But previously, it was. I just want to. I want to understand what, yes, where I, we are. A couple of years ago, it was. Okay. That caused a lot of stress for all educators. I'm sure it caused a lot of stress for kids too. Yeah, yeah, and, and all um, around. And then, so my next question is, um, in terms of test scores, uh, my understanding, again, not to be, not that I am trying to popularize anything, but students can or parents can decide that their child does not need to take this te these tests, right? They can opt out if they choose to. Yes. What is the outcome for the district if these scores are, I mean, let's let's all be real here, right? So we all know that COVID, uh, they just put in, as a, as a matter of fact, I sent everyone the editorial today from um, the newspaper on the 10th where they talked about kids effectively lost some part of the year for the last three years. Um, so in terms of expectations, I don't think there's any expectation that the kids are suddenly, if they were, you know, 50% three years ago, we're going to be looking at even the same number today. So what is the effect on the district, on the students, on the teachers, on the anybody, when these scores come in and let's say they are lower than they were two years ago? Um, I think the most important piece, and it's gray because it's changing by day, 
is a, um, a participation rate. They look at a 95% participation rate at schools that might may be underachieving, and they and they use that at the at the state level. So it's important that we encourage our kids to take the exams. For what though? They look at the nine, at that rate for what? What does that affect? That's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to. I I want, you see I want it, to it affects the accountability status. It's an indicator. What is, I mean, for a layman who doesn't deal with this, what does that actually mean, though? What is, what does an accountability score mean for a school? Let Dr. B.C. speak on this briefly. Whether the school is in good standing or not. Whether the school is passing or it's failing. So that's what it means by the accountability status. So even though on one hand they said you cannot um, force anybody to take the test, on the other hand, they still penalize the school district for that. And that, that is in effect this year? It was in last year, too. Yes. Okay. Thank you for explaining it. You're welcome. You got yours? No, but we can move on. Okay. I always have more questions. Okay. Um, also, I have two more items on, on my report, and then I, I will be done. First of all, I want to publicly thank Dr. Smith for overseeing the special ed department while we have been in the search for a new director. Uh, in the interim, I have asked Dr. Smith to share a status report for how we're doing with making up related services from the pandemic and how uh, the new staff we did, the board did approve some additional staffing. Um, Dr. Smith has been working on putting people in place to help catch up those results um, and close the gaps, primarily around providing those services that students missed as a result of COVID um, everywhere. Um, and so school districts are trying to reconcile uh, old services and new services simultaneously. Dr. Smith? Thank you, you so much, Sue. Yes. Thank you. Um, ironically, I had a meeting today with the individuals who are now providing makeup services to our students who missed their services last year, particularly during the pandemic. Um, as you're aware, it has been difficult to get people to work beyond their regular school day because people didn't want to um, teach on a one-to-one -one basis. They was concerned about um, <coughs> the pandemic and you know, the whole atmosphere, it's been a little difficult. But when I took over in January, we had one social worker that um, was willing to work and one speech provider. Since that time, we received five more individuals um, who have come forward to provide counseling services. So we have six for counseling, and one for speech. We've divided up the counseling, and it's about 43 students per counselor to provide services in the evening or the weekend. We still have many students that need um, someone to provide services for speech, and we're working on that as well. So um, I'm, I'm really happy about the fact that we're trying to put a dent in it. Um, which we're trying our endeavor best to complete those services or make up by the end of the school year. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think back in October, um, HR put postings out for like 10 social workers and 10 speech pathologists back in October. I believe it was somewhere on or around the 18th or something like that. Was there anyone hired to do the compensatory services? From back then? Those individuals were hired to provide services during the regular school day. Um, so we did hire people, is what you're saying? We, we hired people to fulfill vacancies. Uh, it wasn't quite 10 each, but there, there's been some vacancies, and we continue to have uh, um, vacancies today. You know, people... Was it, for yeah. was it for the makeup services that they lost during the pandemic? There was makeup. We hired people for makeup services. We got one um, social worker and one speech. That was back in October. October, yeah. Okay. So, so out of the 10 to 20 that we put out, we only got one? We, we only received one speech and one social worker to do makeup services. Um, Why is that? Do you know? 
that's who responded to the posting. <clears throat> so um, we received, shortly thereafter, we received another social worker. And uh, during our last board meeting, we received four more people that's willing to provide the services. I'm good. Okay. All right. Um, I just know. I just want to piggyback a little bit on what um, President Sanders was saying, and it seems that um, we, it's not only. I just want to tell the public that it's not only us. It's not only a Mount Vernon issue. It is a national issue because a lot of these providers are also certified to be private providers, and they are making more money in the private sector than working in, you know, for a school district. It's the same thing with um, therapists and psychiatrists and everything else. They are making more money not taking um, insurance, for example, because it is a desperately needed um, service. So I just want to make the, pu the public to understand that it's not that we are not working hard to get these positions filled. It is just extremely difficult to do it. Thank, thank you. Um, and lastly, at the last board meeting, uh, the board had some questions while Dr. Collins is coming up. The board had some questions about a tab that was presented for uh, Denzel Washington School of the Arts at the Nellie Thornton campus. And I asked Dr. Collins if she would come tonight and talk a little bit about her program that will in part respond to your query on how uh, professionals are used and how students are provided apprenticeships uh, in their wings. Dr. Collins? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I am Dr. Evelyn Collins, proud founder of the Denzel Washington School of the Arts, also its principal. I'm not certain where I should start, Dr. Hamilton, if you want me to deal with the soldier's play or my uh, presentation. Yeah, start with that. Your presentation's a little lengthy, Dr. Collins. But it's going to go by quickly. Okay. All right. <laughs> and it was such a pleasure to be here to finally get to discuss our school. And I... I was here last when I uh, spoke about the Gifted and Talented program. And so to be able to stand here and to represent my students, my staff, and my parents, um, and share with you some of the wonderful things we've been doing. So I won't read the mission statement because I'm certain you know what that is. But our school is a school designed for excellence. It's designed for excellence for students in grades 6 through 12. It's designed for excellence in teachers who will come back into teaching because they'd like to be a part of what it is we're offering. Uh, the students in our school, they audition, and they audition in theater, dance, visual arts, um, acting, and even technical theater. We've added technical theater to our entree. But we're open to all, school, all families in Mount Vernon with students entering grade six through nine. So we're in the process of auditioning and enrolling students to this very day, which is <laughs> very hard. These are the majors. I just shared those with you, so I don't have to go back. But we offer a litany of advanced placement courses. So when you look at this, you'll see we have 10 um, advanced placement courses in our school, including AP Biology, AP U.S. History, AP Calculus, and so on. The piece that's most, I think, impressive and what you will appreciate as a board is our growth as a school. So when you take a look at the data, you'll notice that at the beginning of the year, 33% um, of our students were at Tier 1. And that's where we want to, you know, Tier 1 is the good tier. Um, but where we are presently, 43% of our students are at Tier 1. So there's been growth, and there continues to be growth um, in math, you'll take a look at this. This was 2021, and we went from 11% to 32% in terms of growth, in terms of students being on grade level. 
we went um, from 33% um, to 20%, but we added that with the 32. So what you end up with is almost 76% of our students are on grade level. And I think the board would appreciate that. Um, and you'll note that it, with regards to our student assessment, same thing, there's growth. So there's a 92% growth. I think the highest you can have is 100%. So we've had 92% growth in math. When you look at reading, it's very similar. So we used our, our uh, iReady data to share this. But you'll notice that we went from 37% tier one and we rose to 56% tier one. Um, so we're closing the achievement gap uh, amongst our students, between our students. Same thing, same data. We're, we're growing, basically, is what this data is, is sharing with you, and we're very proud of it. I have a, a host of teachers who work, it, it almost feels like day and night, um, on the academic component of our school to ensure that our data is correct and that our kids are growing. In 2020, when I took over, 2019 was there as well, it had 84%. But I, when I took over Nellie Thornton's uh, school, our graduate, had, the students who were there had two years to go. We graduated 92% of those students. We also, last year, had a 100% graduation rate. And this year, we're projecting a 98% graduation rate. Um, You'll also find that 65% of our students in grades 6 through 12 we receive recognition on the principal's honor roll, the high honor roll, and the honor roll. And the students who fall behind them, maybe 10% of those students, are two to three, two to three points um, from earning an 85 average. Um, so we encourage them to grow, and we encourage them to do their very best work. Um, our school came into the building 2018-2019, and the suspension rate was 40, 45 students. But you'll note two years prior to that, it was at 161 and 208. Then we had 22 suspensions. Last year we had zero. And then this year, so far, we've had 14. So we're bringing the suspension rate down um, with our students. These are the various partnerships we have. Um, we're with Westchester Conservatory, Concordia Conservatory, Juilliard, Purchase, um, Pelham Arts Center, and the list goes on. Our students are involved in these partnerships, and they're growing as artists and doing quite well. Um, I think what works for us is that they're able to have an authentic experience, and the fact that we're integrating the arts in all subject matters, so that all of the teachers, whether they're arts teachers or... <laughs> Academic teachers learn how to integrate the arts into those subject areas. We have a number of creative projects we're working on this year. We're going to publish our first book. It's called The COVID Chronicles. It's uh, a book written by the students about their experience during the pandemic, and it encompasses students in grades 7 through 10. We just had a phenomenal living wax museum, African American living wax museum, with our students in grade six, where they became historical figures um, from the African American experience, and they did quite well. Um, I think it's on the website, so you, you're able to see it. Our drumline just came back yesterday, first place. Our kids have won Metro Awards in theater. Our orchestra were the grand champions of the Orlando Music Festival. And they also were invited to Albany for the 85th annual conference where no school um, in Mount Vernon or in this area was invited. Very proud of them. Um, I'm almost there, Dr. Hamilton. You're good, you're good. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to share some of our productions. Our very first year in 2015, we produced You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Um, that was a production where my sixth and seventh graders, it was their first year in the school, and they performed like seasoned professionals. We're very proud of them. Then we did Suzuko, the musical. So you can tell the production value, um, the expertise, uh, the work that goes into our productions are second to none. And I believe we make our school district proud. We also produced um, The Lion King. And it was sold out every, you know, the main floor. This is when these pictures are from when we did it at Mount Vernon High School. You'll notice John Aiden, who's sitting right there in the blue suit. 
as Zazu. He was only in seventh grade at the time, or maybe eighth. We were the first high school to ever produce an August Wilson's production, My Rainey's Black Bottom, um, to public acclaim. And Miss Felicia Rashad, who was directing it at the same time in California, later came back, did a master class with my actors and was quite impressed in terms of their ability. Our school is the only school that participates in the NAACP AXO uh, competition, and our students have gone on to the Nationals, winning gold, bronze, and silver medals. We've appeared on numerous newspapers. Um, it's been kind of cool to do that, and it brings a lot of pride to our school community. Um, and then in 2019, the auditorium was renovated and named after Ms. Felicia Rashad in a ceremony that featured individuals from the Metropolitan Opera, from Broadway, from television, from film. And that was all to support the program and to support our endeavors in the school. So I, I believe one of the questions was posed to me, why use professionals in the arts? Why not have the kids do it? And it would be wonderful, and we're working towards that. But what we found, for example, with the musicians, our kids need music in all of their schools. So in the absence of having music in all the K-8 to schools, they come to our school having played no instrument. So we either start them at sixth grade or we start them at ninth grade, depending on when they enter the school. By the time we get them through the cycle, and when they feel like they're kind of close to being ready to do it, they're graduating. So my push is for to increase music and arts in all the K-8 to schools in the district so that the kids get the experience to play an instrument, learn to play an instrument, and then by the time they get to our school, we can move them, we can accelerate them. Um, also, our professionals in the arts, you know, they're, they're folk who are working in the pit. The musicians are pit musicians on Broadway. So when they come to our school, they're paired with a student, and the student learns from a professional. And when you have professionals in the arts, akin to all of my arts teachers, all eight of them, they're all professionals. They're dancers, they're choreographers, they're musicians. Whatever it is they teach, they also still practice. That serves to accelerate uh, the children's learning in their art form. These are some of the folk that we've employed. Um, musical, the color purple, um, you name it, they've been in it. And they come to our school and they charge us like nickels compared to what they make on Broadway or what they make off Broadway. But by the time the students are finished with them, they've grown, they've grown, and the kids are wonderful. We use a professional costume designer. So when you come to our school, you see these magnificent costumes and you have kids who are learning how to create costumes, how to work with professionals. Um, and we love Miss Gladys James, she's phenomenal. Every show I've produced in Mount Vernon, Miss James has designed the costumes. And she makes them all, you know, she just looks at you and she creates the costume. It's that, that phenomenal. So when you're looking at a production, you're looking at the cost to produce the show, which are the royalties. So when a playwright writes the play, the playwright has to be paid for the rights for us to produce the play. That's what you call royalties. You also have to buy the material. We don't go to the store and shop and take something off the rack. We have to buy fabric. Um, you have to buy all of the materials that go along with creating costumes. Um, set and lighting design, you know how critical that is to a production. Um, with a low budget lighting, a set and light design of phenomenal costumes and phenomenal work on the stage, it creates an imbalance. Um, you also have the cost of the musicians, um, who I think are necessary when we do a musical. But what are the, what are the values of, of, of a quality production? How does it serve everyone in the city? It doesn't just service my students and my school. It services the district. It also services the city, and it creates this, this pride that you, that you just can't cut the energy when you're in the theater after a production. It also gives the students self-pride. Um, and it stimulates their imagination and creativity. And who wouldn't want their child's imagination and creativity to be stimulated? I'll end on this. I just want to show this uh, video so you can get a sense of, I hope I'm doing this right. Um, no, how do I go back? Um, please. 
So you can see the community, how the community responds. So this was during the pandemic. We were lucky. We got to get to our last performance and then everything shut down. So we felt very fortunate and I imagine the audience did too. Productions are students in all grades, 6 through 12. So we're including everyone, whether they're in front of the scenes, on the stage, behind the scenes, um, working with the costume designer. Phenomenal. The students did an excellent job. I'm glad that Broadway came to Mount Vernon, finally. Great job. Two thumbs up. It was awesome. I loved it. Every minute of it. Huh? Great, great. This is the second time. Awesome. It gets better and better. The show was excellent. It was very good. The children did well. Beautiful show. I love my girl Kali. She was one of the dancers. I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of the production. It was so good. Thank you guys. Always Mount Vernon. It just does a big thing. Beautiful performance. It's so much for $10 and much more. It was absolutely, positively, optimistically outstanding. Did a great job, Denzel, Dr. Collins. Kudos. And I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Well done as usual. Well done. This, this was beyond incredible. All of the actors and the musicians, the dancers, the costumes, it couldn't have been better. It was amazing. How about you, ma'am? What, what I think about her, I I mean, I loved it. It was amazing. I've seen the Broadway show and I've seen this one and it's like amazing. If you would think there was no pandemic. That's how nice and just everything ran smoothly. You couldn't ask for a better day. Every student was awesome. There we go. This is Broadway worthy. Come see it. I mean, it's no different. They it should have the tickets were at a bargain price. Okay, they are talented youth. Come out and support them for their next play. We know Nala personally. I wish I knew all of them. God bless. It's amazing that they've been able to pull this off. And it's also amazing how, in all all crises, we can make something amazing. Yeah. It was beautiful. I want to okay, come back. Okay, Dr. Collins. Again. Not the first time. I'm from Long Island. Is that the end? I came through a friend, Mr. Jackson. He does work like this, so he invited me to come, and I loved it. I want to see it again. It was amazing, honestly. I would, I would see it twice. I would see it for the rest of my life. It was better than Broadway. Like it was so amazing. Like the, the acting was. Not Professional from top to bottom. Mount Vernon, we have to support our babies. We gotta love our babies. They just made me so proud. I actually was in tears, you know, as the, the end of the show was coming. I'm so proud. Please know that we support your children, we love your children, and we will do everything to elevate the work that is being done in our community. Mount Vernon is proud. God bless you and thank you so much.
well done, and that wasn't long at all, actually. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dr. Collins will gladly ask, answer any questions trustees may have. Uh, also, Dr. Collins, one of the are you going to ask your question? Yeah. Okay, all right, go ahead. All right. Um, one of the questions is is about the revenue generated from the school, uh, from the productions. Um, what, um, how much revenue do you generally generate? And I know it fluctuates. And how do you utilize those resources um, for your building? Thank you. Uh, you recall when we started the program, I had a $1.5 million grant from New York State Department of Education that I wrote on behalf of our school. So for three years, we existed off of that grant, stretching it so that we'd be able to produce quality shows. The money goes back into the shows. The money goes into feeding the kids in between rehearsals, in between performances, buying tap shoes, buying other pieces, they care pieces. Um, when we were in the school, when we rehearse, we're rehearsing from 3 until 6.30. The district, no one is providing food or dinner for the kids. So sometimes we buy pizza, um, we buy Subway, whatever we can do to feed the kids whose parents don't provide them with money. Uh, we produce other shows. We have art showcases so that we don't uh, charge the district at all. We produce it from the budget that we have from these shows. So when you saw the Christmas show, the Christmas play, when you saw um, the Black History Month performance, the Juneteenth performance, that's at no cost to the district. So those funds are taken from the money, the revenue that we make from producing these shows. And about how much do you say you guys made from The Lion King? We made, I have my treasurer here, um, we made about 20000 Give or take. So I think, I, um, Evelyn, you do, so, this is right here. Oh, thank you. You do a phenomenal job. That's no question about it. Mm -hmm. I think the question that some of the board members had um, were the people you have here as artists, Holly Ayers, are these people here? Are, they, are these the people that are, um, do they work in the building every day? What's this, what's their position? What's their you know, are you just using them to um, do costume designs and lighting designs? What's the No, thank you for that question. Um, the set designer is the professor of the stage design program at Howard University. The young woman, Amina Alexander, I think people confused her with my secretary, Michelle Alexander. Amina Alexander is a professional lighting designer who just finished two shows off Broadway. Holly Ayers, if you notice the makeup and the hair on any of the characters, that's her work. That's her background. And Joseph Dempsey is a professional stage, design, uh, stage manager, but he's also our technical design teacher in the school. So is, at any point, do the children learn this? That's the whole piece of it, uh, President Saunders. The whole piece is that the kids who are aligned to a professional, they sit beside them. So they're learning about, in the technical theater class, they learn about how much it costs. Where does the money go? Um, how do you make, how do you stretch a dollar? Um, when they're with the musicians, they're learning how to play in the pit with professional musicians. Our last show, we had Divinity, who was Beyonce's bass player. And so she loves to come to our school and work with our children, and she's even taken one of our students, and she does private lessons, and she works with her to help her to grow and understand about the industry. So it's a cross-section of things that are happening. The kids who are working directly with the professionals, the kids who are in the technical theater class, the kids who are acting and I'm directing them. I'm always talking about my experience. I'm a professional actor, director, producer, and so I'm able to bring that experience to our school and that's why you get the quality um, of production. So the kids are all around learning about the arts. I was recently nominated for a Tony Award, um, the American Theater Wing, and we're still waiting to hear and see if I won, but I was nominated for an Excellence in Theater Award through the, the, the Antoinette Tony um, Society um, that distributes the Tony Awards um, and Carnegie Mellon. So we're waiting on that. Um, so the work, I mean, I'm giving you work as if I'm in the professional arena, but I'm staging it, I'm putting it on children. 
And so when you see them in performance, they're way above. I, I dare you to look at any other production, high school production, middle school production, and look for kids who look like our kids and see if they're working on that level. I doubt that you'll find them. No, and I'm, I'm sorry. I just have to, let me just take this off. I do have to also congratulate you. I think that what you're doing in the school is a great job. But it's just the, the fact that, um, and at least for me, when, when we voted for the Lion King, and I need um, clarification, please, if I'm not saying the right thing, please, anybody stop me and clarify. Um, that was one of the things that we voted for the kids to be trained so they could take over for the next production. Like they could be the ones doing the lighting. They could be the ones doing, you know. So that's what, that's, that's, I need clarification on that because that's what I thought that we voted on. Am I wrong? Are you, are you asking me? No, I, oh. I just, because that's what I thought. So you say. You could, uh, uh, Dr. Collins, if you could uh, just talk about how the apprenticeships work with the students, and then I'm going to let you have your seat. Um, but, in, and then and the board can have further discussion. Um, but in terms of, I think what the trustees are, are getting at, which is the main reason I asked you to be here this evening, um, the presentation was great, by the way. Um, the main reason I asked you to be here this evening is so that the board could hear directly from you your vision for at what point are students ready to run the production? It's going to take a minute. Um, and I wish it was that simple. I wish they could work on one show and now they're ready to produce a second show. Even in college, it doesn't work that way. So it takes work. It takes training. It takes practice. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, because our kids are coming from other schools where they don't have that same experience, we start them when they get to our school. So it takes a moment for them to grow into it. Mm -hmm. And by the time they may be ready, we have a couple of kids who can um, music direct. We have kids who can choreograph. Um, so they're, they're growing, but they're not there yet to produce it. But trust me. The vision is for there to be an all-student orchestra. When I was a, an assistant principal in Ann Arbor, that's what happened. The kids grew, and they grew. And one of the first shows we did with them where it was just all student musicians in the pit is West Side Story. So if you're familiar with that score, you know how difficult it is. But those kids were also getting private training outside of school. So you can't just come to school and expect that the training that you're going to get in a 42-minute class is going to prepare, prepare you to produce a professional quality production. Um, that's why I started the Saturday Arts Academy. The Saturday Arts Academy is in place so the little ones can start to get the arts training. And then they can grow, and by the time they get into our school, they'll be good to go. I have, I have, I have something to say. So I, I just want to know, from your expertise, do you feel as though that the students who are sitting side by side and being an apprentice, can they run a show in an elementary school, on an elementary school level? Never thought of that. They possibly could. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, they you possibly could. You, you were reading my notes, woman, because I hey, have Dr. it right Dr. here. Dr. Collins, <laughs> I'm, one, I'm, one. I'm trying to get a word in before I'm trying, she I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I, yeah. You were reading my notes. Have a band program because we at one time mm -hmm. we always. I mean, I've been told, yeah. Band. You don't. You don't even have a band at Mount Vernon High School. Gotcha. Okay, so you don't have a band at the top, the biggest high school in the city. Um, we don't have a band at Steam. That's not their focus. But Mount Vernon High School does not have a band. And when I was director of the arts for the district for four years, that's one of the things I was trying to work on. But you have to move personnel around and you have to get people to come in who are professionals. What you tend to have in most of the schools are teachers. So when you have individuals who are teaching math, but they're not playing in a band, or they're not playing at a club, and they're not practicing the music still, they're limited in terms of what they can do to improve the musical uh, quality in that school. So I, I don't know any school that has a band. I know schools have music, but I don't know them to have bands if that answers your question. But lastly, doc, um, I'm sorry, doctor, how, 
So let's say like a ninth grader or let's say like sixth graders right now that are in the apprentice program. No, the high school kids are. Oh, the, the high school kids. Yeah, the high school kids are. So do you believe like probably by this senior year they will be able to? Um, I have seniors now who are able to. They're about to graduate in three months. Oh, okay. So no, but that's, that's because but See, that's this is what you have. So this is what you have to understand. All of the kids do not start in the sixth grade. Some of the kids, like the kids who are at Amani Charter School, that school ends in the eighth grade. They come to us in the ninth grade. So we have a large group of kids who are coming to us in the ninth grade mm -hmm. with no training. So with Ms. Thomas, who's sitting here with me this evening, she's the orchestra teacher. When those kids came into our school, they were scratching the violin. Now they're playing the violin. They're playing the cello. But that's because she's there before school, at lunch, after school, on Saturdays, and she's doing all of that work. In the absence of having that sort of commitment to the arts, the kids are not going to grow. But fortunately for us, we have experts in the arts who are able to help them grow. But if it was a little bit more consistent, I think, in terms of the K-8 to schools, and we were able to start training them, then you would see what it is you're talking about. But because you get a mixture of middle school kids and high school kids. Some of them come in sixth grade, some come ninth grade. We have some who are like phenoms. I mean, they're able to do what it is they do. This, one of my students sitting here, um, Kendall McDowell is one of those kids. Your kid sitting up here on your uh, panel, actor, um, John Aiden Wilson. So you have those kids who come in with that specialness. Mm -hmm. And then you have some who just want to be there. So you got to really train them, get them focused. There's a lot to do with discipline. It's a lot of work. But that's why we created, again, the Saturday Arts Academy, so we can have our hand on some of those kids and open it to the entire school district, not just one area. We open it to everybody. Doc, Dr. Collins, I don't, I did, it wasn't my intent to put you in a position it's where you okay. need to defend your program. I don't I, feel like I'm defending Dr. Hamilton. Because I don't no, I'm want fine. you in that position. No, I'm, I'm um, fine. However, I do think you're providing um, some really important information for our trustees to know about the background and about what happens behind the scenes that we don't always get to appreciate. And more importantly, to develop a <coughs> quality performing arts school, the gift that we have that you do have access to so many professionals who come in and support our students and the readiness that they leave with. Uh, so I, I do, you have another question, Trustee? Okay. I also have questions. Oh, um, okay. How you doing, Dr. Collins? I am well, Trustee Mitchell. Um, of course, thank you. What you bring to the district is amazing, always has been. Great quality and an expectation. We know what to expect, the very best. So, um, but I'm gonna ask questions on the other side of the other side of the coin from the academic side and things like that, which um, while we know the performing arts side of it is fully enriched, we know it. It's healthy and you continue and everyone involved continues. I got a couple of questions. Uh, like, so for instance, I noticed you mentioned suspension rates going down, down, down. What would you say contributed to that? Because we know that, say for instance, the same challenges that the normal high school has, Denzel Washington has, the fights happen, the bullying happens. It's not, I can't, we can't truly say that, that Denzel Washington is, all, is like a place where none of these things happen. It does. I know that for a fact. I think a lot of us here should and do. But what do you think, how, did, how were you able to bring those suspension rates down when these things are still happening? Or is it that some of these things maybe are being treated as suspension topics in other buildings, but you don't? No, I don't think so. I think what happens is, and I was sharing this with Dr. Hamilton, I mediate. So it, as a principal, I'm mediating whenever there's a whiff, uh, a hint that there may be a fight. Or the kids will bring it to me and say, Dr. Collins, this girl bullied me or this kid. And I bring them in. So tier one is me mediating these situations with these children. Tier two involves bringing their parents in. So if one kid is bullying another kid, both parents have to come in. Because I'm not training kids to be bullies, the parents have that responsibility. So I try to keep them involved as much as possible. They're fearful that they're going to lose their spot in the school. You know, um, they think they're going to be removed from the school, that they'll be kicked out. And once upon a time, we did kind of scare them with that. 
but that's not the case anymore. So we try to be straight up, straightforward. We have some knuckleheads. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to, to the moon and bring down the best kids in there in our school. Mm -hmm. They're the same kids that are in all the other schools. Mm -hmm. But it's something, I think, Trustee Mitchell, about them being passionate about their art form mm -hmm. and about them enjoying participating in their arts form. They kind of, you know, they're fights. You know there are. Yeah. Um, but there's something about being able to do what you love to do. You don't want to remove yourself from that and not have the opportunity to do it anymore. So that's part of what we do. I don't have a dean. I don't have an assistant principal of, of culture and whatever the other stuff is. Time's up. The st <laughs> stop. The, the, um, the, other, the other question I had, and, and I'm... <laughs> The other question I had was related to um, to the graduation race because if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Denzel Washington has one of these. If I'm not mistaken, and Dr. Jeff Gorman, keep me true, one of the smallest high schools in the district, right? So yes. to be able to say that you have these incredible the, these test scores as high as you do and the graduation race makes it um, makes it a little bit easier than it would if you're comparing it to another high school of much more students. No. It this, seems like it should. I understand. It seems like it should, but that's not the case at all. Our middle school numbers um, rival the middle school numbers in the K-8 schools in this district. So the data I presented to you, the numbers that we have in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, if you look at the enrollment, we have the same numbers. Um, you can look at the high school and say you have 60 kids, but we don't have to have a 100% graduation rate with 60 kids. It means they have to pass their regents exams. It means they have to pass all of their classes. It means they still have to do the work all of the other high school students have to do, regardless of the size of the school. The work is the same. Okay. And the final question I have is kind of backtracks to um, related to discipline. What would you say to a statement that, well, if you have talent and you can sing and perform and do these things, but yet you have a bullying problem and you maybe you got in a fight, we'll deal with you a little bit different than we would a child that does not have those same talents in our building. What would you say to that statement if you heard it? Would well, you say, I, how, would you speak, how could you speak to the validity of that statement? Because I'm not certain, um, the kid is talented and phenomenal, and so they get preferential treatment. Is, mm -hmm. that, the, is that the question? Yeah. That isn't the case. Um, parents are called in. I have, I have my parents' phone numbers in my phone. I talk to them, and most of our gifted kids don't get into trouble. They're too busy rehearsing, performing. The gifted kids? What about the, the really fe The phenons, the, the exceptional kids. Okay. I okay. thought that was your question. No, no, I was talking as a whole. I'm, looking, I'm, I'm talking about the conversation of... You got students that have talents that are excessive, that are that are exceeding, and students that are not, or maybe on their way. Are they treated differently? Is there a favoritism? I don't think the there's building? favoritism. I don't tend to have problems with the kids who are like, if you want to say favorite kids, I don't have problems with them, and I try to deal with all the students the same. Um, I'm not really sure what you're asking me. Is there favoritism for the kids who can sing and dance over the kids that can't? No. And they all do. Well, they, they, are, they do have some favorite behavioral kids, yes. challenges. That's but my they point. don't have discipline problems, so. I have I have kids I adore who could do Broadway. You know, I have kids who are. One of my former students is, was just invited out to do America's Got Talent. Okay. Um, so I understand what you're saying, but I don't think that's the case at all. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know Trustee Mitchell. I mean, Trustee Munoz Patterson. And did you suggest your hand up, Trustee Sorensen? No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm, Mike, I'll go. Mike. I'll go after. Oh, Micah. Okay. <laughs> I knew it was somebody on my right. Not me. Go ahead. Um. So just really quickly, I had a question. Um. Since we're in the budget process, um, I'd like to talk about maybe looking at the arts for the elementary school level and seeing where we can beef up. Because um, I was actually talking to President Saunders the other day about how band day was a great day um, and how all the schools came out and I was a band geek, so I was there. Um, but I think one of the points when we're talking about the professionals performing with the students, and I had made this point to Superintendent Hamilton when I had seen one of the shows, that I felt the professionals almost overpowered the students. And I'd prefer to hear off you know, uh, like a, a wrong note or something sometimes because I like to know that I want to I hear them. You know, I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm just 
No, I hear you. I understand. The point of, at least my point of view. Um, and that's not to say that we shouldn't have professionals. I just wish sometimes, like, I don't know, maybe we could turn down their microphones or something because I'd like to hear the kids more than I'd like to hear mm -hmm. the adults who have all that training. And, and then there are a number of shows that you can go to and find that. What we're attempting to do is create a premier school for the arts. When you look at premier school of the arts, like a Duke Ellington, like a LaGuardia, like a Booker T. Washington, they're premier school for the arts. Um, there's going to come a time where the younger kids will produce their own shows, and you will get that. When I'm producing the show, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get the wrong note and turn the microphone down so you can hear that. It's not going to happen because my standards and my expectations for my students is that they move towards professionalism. To be and perfectly by blunt, I'm sorry, let's stop the train for one second. To be perfectly blunt, when somebody tells me that we're performing, that the students are performing, you're, you're, then we're not hearing the students. We're not putting the students are not putting on these performances. Then it's the professional putting on the performance because it's a professional that's overpowering. Well, then you would have to look at me and say the same thing. I'm a professional. Um, you shouldn't answer. I, I don't know how to answer. I understand what you're asking, and at some point it will come to that. But that's not what I produce. I don't produce shows where things are wrong. But we're working. So um, I think we have some uh, trustees down here. Mr. McCowan. Hi, Dr. Collins. Hello. Um, I was at that Lion King production, and I've been at, um, I think, all but one of the productions that have been done. They're all fantastic and excellent. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I recognize, let me try to interpret what I think we're all trying to say. Um, because I, having, as you know, a wife in the performing arts, um, I know what it takes to train teenagers um, to become professionals. And the experience of sitting alongside a professional is invaluable, and that's how you learn. It's by sitting next to the best that you become the best. Um, I also rec but but I don't want to, uh, I want, want to echo, I think, what everybody else is saying is that um, that can never be at the expense of showcasing the children for what that's worth. Um, I also recognize and echo something you said and something which I think this is leading to a broader conversation, which is good, uh, is how do we support the arts district wide, right? How do we build the, the foundation of interest and talent, right, to lead to a really exceptional program? Because when we started this, look, I mean, years ago, when we started the whole concept of having a performing arts high school, the, this is not a focus on you. It was not a focus on any particular art. It was looking at, look, we have, we know, we have a large district. We had a lot of kids. So just statistically, we, got, we have talent here in the city. Number two, we know on, on an individual and specific level many, many examples of phenomenal artistic talent that have come from this city, mm -hmm. acting, music, and otherwise. Right? Uh, and number three, we had a building. We had a building with a historic performing arts stage that needed a renovation, but it was there. Like this, it's all the tools you need to have a great program are there. Right? And then now, fast forward a couple years, we're a couple years into implementing that program, and it will continue to grow. And all I'm doing is highlighting for everybody that you can't have a student orchestra without enough kids, right? You have to have enough kids who want to do it and have the talent to do it before you can have a whole orchestra. And until we get to that point, which I think is what you're saying, yes. you have to supplement it, obviously, if you want to have a good show, let alone a great show, right? You, ha you have to supplement it. Um, so I recognize that if you only have one violinist, you can't have an orchestra. And if you only have one oboist, you can't have an orchestra, right? So there's a, there's, and if you only have one person on the chorus, you can't run much of a show. So a, a lot of this, I think, stems from continuing to push and accelerate the arts in the elementary school level mm. um, so that by the time, it's the same thing with sports, right? You can't, you, your high school sports program is, program is never going to be great unless you have a good middle school sports program feeding into it. Mm -hmm. These things don't happen overnight. You don't develop this talent in one year or two or four. So I, I hear all that. Um, I hope the work will continue. 
Um, one question I had just generally about the program, I have a question about the agenda item, which I, I assume I can wait until we actually have that. Um, but just generally, what opportunity, because my wife, one of the reasons my wife is successful at what she does is because she was given opportunities during high school to go and professionally perform. And she had the flexibility built into that school to allow that to happen. And I want to make sure that uh, that that opportunity exists for students if and when the time comes for students to have those opportunities where that, the, and, and I know you obviously, it's a public school, your requirements you have to satisfy, I understand that. But um, is there a structure in place to allow that kind of flexibility for students who do have opportunities to start their careers now? Sure. Uh, well, one of our students, Judah Taylor, was just in the opera at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, another student did two, three Broadway shows. Um, that's before he came to the school, but he kind of sustained that. He was a student at LaGuardia, and he transferred into our school and was quite successful. Um, we have students who, with the proper training, we have kids um, in the orchestra who earn a little cash when they go out and perform. They're hired, you know, by different organizations and, and different individuals, and they're paid. And that goes towards saving up for college, and they're phenomenal. So they're able to do that. But trust me, when they came in as sixth and seventh graders, they were not at that level. And they wouldn't have had that opportunity had it not been for their teacher. Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Collins. Madam President. Yeah, I have you, one thing to say, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Yeah, I'm a product of the school system of Mount Vernon. Musically, I've been around the world, OK? We didn't have the program that you have at Denzel Washington when I was going to school. I'm very adamant about getting that program in every single school in this city. It shouldn't just be there. And I think that when you have these programs like you have, it becomes intimidating for those who are talented and who do have the, the, um, the gift to do it, but they are not mature enough to understand the process of going about doing it. Mm -hmm. So we have to get these programs in every single school in mm -hmm. Mount Vernon so that we can develop these children to become professionals because mm -hmm. we didn't get that development. By God's grace, we were able to take our gift and, you know, do things that, you know, a lot of people couldn't do. That's why they say Mount Vernon is four square miles, but it's full of culture, Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just want to see that in every single school in Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Madam, to, so any other questions for Evelyn? No, I just wanted to um, end with um, uh, Dr. Ella. Uh, for individuals that are listening, just to let you know, when a child attends a school like the School of the Arts in, in particular, um, the, the, the multiple intelligences are being tapped into. You have uh, visual artists. Uh, Mozart was musical, right? He might not have been good linguistic or mathematically, but he was good musical-wise. Right. Dancers oh, yeah. and, and their craft, kinetics comes out. Mm -hmm. um, so students get a chance to exhibit their knowledge through movement and through acting. And there are some students who are unable or intimidated to exhibit their knowledge through paper and multiple choice and writing essays. But damn it, when they get up there on that stage, they will rock any multiple choice song, any essence movement mm -hmm. that is there. And so that, what happens is that that lends to when it's time for them to sit down and take some type of pen and paper exam and have some kind of courage to say, well, I can do this because I can do that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And so um, from my understanding that the, the board, are, we are all in agreement that we would like to see, we would like for students in our elementary schools and in our middle uh, middle schools, schools yeah. to also have that same kind of rich um, Program. journey mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be able to exhibit their knowledge and yeah. not just exhibit it in, uh, in, in, a, in a vacuum with a reading short answer tests and um, yeah. Yeah, and just to so go back thank to you. what you were saying, Cynthia, we talked about multiple intelligence and being misunderstood. I think that's the word is being misunderstood mm -hmm. because I was in special ed classes. Why? Because a lot of the times you 
all they you know you're not going with everyone else you're doing something mm -hmm. outside you're singing or you're beating on a desk and next thing yep. you know you're put yep. in special way you know so multiple intelligence is very important when it comes to being creative yeah. and um like I said, we're gonna we're gonna make this happen for sure. Okay. You know what, Jeff? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Madam President, but you raised that wig for up because I told Madam President that I was gonna jump in something because I was gonna ask the question: How many special ed classes do you have in your school? Students. students I'm sorry. Special ed students do you have in your school? I couldn't. With tell. IEPs. I don't know, Marcy. I don't know. Um, as you say, you don't know either. <laughs> The reason, the reason why I ask is because exactly what um, my fellow trustee, uh, Turquoise Jones, was mentioning um, about the multiple intelligences and how so many of our special needs students are not given that opportunity to shine. You know, so many of our autistic children might be misunderstood. Yeah. So many of our Down syndrome children might be misunderstood, and they might need that, uh, you know, that opportunity. And this is why I'm asking right now, I would like, you know, later on if that information could be given to me, how many special needs kids have been approved to go into your high school? And then you have to ask how many of them have auditioned. When I was principal... But that's the whole thing. I it's know. like, why, why should they audition? They should be given an opportunity to be the... You know, our, our like, trustee read. Read, read. They should be given that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the way it works, the parents have to believe um, and, and encourage their kids. When I was principal in New York City, 25% of my kids had an IEP. And they were some of the most talented kids in the city. Yep. So we don't frown upon kids if they come in with an IEP. It depends on if the parent brings them and wants them to audition like all of the other kids. But have we encouraged that to happen? I don't know how you expect me to do that. I'm not sure. No, no, but it's like, you know, when the auditions are open and we are uh, making the audition public, have we encouraged the... Not any more than any other child. No, I just... No, it hasn't been mentioned. Like, it doesn't matter. I'm saying matter not any more than any other child. Needs. No, because I just want to be... I hear you. It has been specified. That's all. Because it's like parents might be, feel intimidated because it is a specialized high school. I you think what we probably saying? could do is get together some of our special ed students and then we can talk to them and their parents. And that might be a way to understand it a little bit better, right? Please, okay. I will appreciate it. Yes. That. Thank okay. you. So let's move on. We, we were, I think we were talking about this one resolution and we kind of got all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Evelyn, I have one question. Yes. Right here. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so on the resolution, um, <clears throat> You have hours um, sessions, and I just have a question as to some of them have 125 hours, you do, and then some of them have, just what's that resolution, 40 hours and 50 hours. So it depends on President um, Saunders. It, it, it depends on their role. If I'm there every day, five days a week, three hours a day. I understand you. Right. But the other, the other, um, I lost it, but yeah. But the other staff, how is it broken down that some have 50, some have 40? It depends on the, what they're doing, the, their job. If you're a set designer, builder, construction person, it depends on how many hours it takes to build a set. Soldiers play takes place in a, bunk, a, a bunker. Mm -hmm. So that's a full set where you see the beds and you see the lockers and you see the ups. It's a set. So it depends on how long it takes them to build that set. This gentleman being a professor at Howard University, and it's what he does professionally as well, he's minimizing what he's charging me to do for our school. It depends on how long it takes the lighting designer to create a lighting plot, meaning where are the lights dark, where are the lights warm, where are the lights cool, that's work. And by the time they finish that, and then putting all the cues together to match what's happening in this, it's a process, it's theater. Um, so I've minimized their hours. It doesn't usually take 40 hours to do that. It takes more. So if he's, say if he's there 10 days, four hours, that's what you got with your 40 hours. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying You're welcome. that. You're welcome. Right. Thank if, you, Dr. Collins. If we're asking um, questions about the resolution, I do have a question about the okay. resolution. My, resolu my question is um, I, I have no, I have no uh, dispute that you are qualified to direct this play. Absolutely. I've directed it twice. I know. Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, what efforts do you make to get other 
outside people, other outside talent to come in and take part it's of it. It's coming. To it's direct coming. the shows. Most definitely. So to broaden the students' horizons beyond just you, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Um, so I work really hard on behalf of the students. I'm bringing in folk who are like Shakespearean. That's not my expertise. So when it's time for us to do a fully staged production of a Shakespeare show, I have to bring in someone else. When it's time to do, you know, different styles of play, this is a play, Charles Fuller, African American, I know the story, I can direct it. Um, if I thought I couldn't, I wouldn't. And I would like to get to the place because I'm gonna move out and do other things professionally. So it would be lovely to have others who can come in and take over directing the children. But for right now, while we're building the program, I'm directing the shows. You know, but I'm, I'll be directing an off-Broadway show um, in New Jersey. So there are a lot of opportunities for me to do professional work. Um, but right now, as we build the program, I have to set the standards. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Collins. I, pr oh, I thought I saw another hand. I appreciate you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Oh, that was your report? <laughs> oh, I wasn't. Okay. Uh, All right. All right, so what's next here? Um, All right, um, Trustee Miller's uh, going to do a presentation. And then after that, we'll do I know you guys are all wide awake, right? Because <laughs> Evelyn is riveting. But it's important. Uh. So as I've mentioned in, um, this is Mike Beeger, by the way. I'm Darcy Miller. Um, as I've mentioned in my various uh, communications committee reports, um, I took it upon myself to get involved and push for a new website for our school district. I feel that the website is really the window into our district, notwithstanding the wonderful performances, of course, but the website is really the window into our district. And I really have heard over the past seven or eight years that I've been volunteering in the district that we do a terrible job of communication. In fact, it was even mentioned tonight, and I don't disagree. Um, however, you know, I would put forth that parents and the community have to meet us halfway, but we are going to go a great distance and light years ahead of where we've been in the next couple of months, and we're going to share a little bit of that with you tonight. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a couple things about process. I will be brief, because I know we have more work to get to, but I want to share a little bit about the process. Um, I've told you why I thought this was important. I believe everyone we've come into contact with in the district in terms of getting this uh, preliminary site, which is under construction, it's not complete, so that means the, the walls are up, there's some windows in, but a lot of rooms are not furnished. So when we give you a little brief demonstration tonight, understand that the content still needs to be created. Um, anyway, so when I got the green light to do this, um, I reached out to Mike Beeger, who's been doing communications for the district for a number of years and is familiar with web development. And then I talked to Dr. Hamilton about putting together a cross-functional team so that we could get input from various people um, within the administration in the school district. So our team has consisted of, up to this point, myself, Mike Beeger, um, Liz Gallo in technology, Kim Smith, Gail White-Wallace, and Sandra O'Connor, parent liaison. And I want to give them all a big shout out because they are working hard. And, and we have a couple of dinners on the line we're going to find out next Tuesday because we, we have a campaign, communications campaign that we need to get a wonderful toothy headline for. Anyway, so we have a cross-functional team and we selected, just so you understand, we selected a vendor called Final Sight 
I did, apparently they were known to uh, Dr. Borman. I found them on the website just searching what firms do K-12 websites, and I found one. They actually work through BOCES. We got a super cheap deal. This is not an expensive endeavor, but it's labor-intensive endeavor. And then the third part of the, so we've been going along with that process. The third part of the commitment to transparency and to a more comprehensive and easier communication and relationship with the community, with our parents and students and all community stakeholders is to have a full-time person, to have a commitment that someone day in and day out is going to be the kind of cop um, on this project. Because if you got outdated data, it doesn't help anybody. If you have to dig 20 clicks in to find an answer, if you're a parent, you're going to freak out, turn off your computer, pick up your phone, and try to call somebody. And you might not get anybody on the phone. So then you'd be really upset, and you might show up at a meeting and take your three minutes and say, you people never answered the phone, I don't know what's going on, blah, blah, blah. So for all these reasons, we need to have a district-wide commitment to a great website. And so we do have that, and I thank the administration for giving us the opportunity and the board for voting to do this, because it's, it's just very, very important for us. So the, the, the key features of this, in addition to being simple to navigate and up to date on a daily basis, is really that it, we're, we're making this totally parent-focused. We're making this outer-focused, not focused to our staff, our faculty, it's focused for our students and our parents in the community. We've tried to anticipate by working with this cross-functional team the key questions that parents asks, ask on a regular basis. When, when you get phone calls, if you're a principal, you're a building leader, why, why are parents calling? What are they trying to find out? Um, we have also have worked with, in addition to doing this first beta site, this one that's under construction, we selected one school and one principal, Dr. Waterman, um, to create a template for our 16 schools, a site, a site for each individual school. So each indiv individual school will have their own site, which they will be able to customize uh, per their needs, all within the template, but they will be able to customize it. So. That's basically it. The whole idea is just a few clicks in. Uh, one of the great features is we have some, and this was, all came from the, the team just sitting around coming up with ideas. We have some great features on the nav bar, a special one that we felt was really important for our community that Mike will show you in a second. Um, we also have a translation feature, which will is you can see it, and it's in the lower right, and we'll demonstrate it for you, but there's a translation feature, so no matter what language you speak, you will be able to click on that on the home page, select the language you would like, and that language will flow through on every page in the website, all the way down to the fine print. I don't think it'll change the Twitter logo, but <laughs> it'll do everything. And because we have cookies, and they're a necessary evil, when you come back, I'm a parent and I speak Haitian Creole, I come back to the site after I've been on it once, and it'll present to me in Haitian Creole. So this is going to be phenomenal for our uh, multi-language community. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we have a mobile version of this also. So, and it is exactly as user-friendly and robust and rich as the computer version, so you will be able to navigate that. We're going to be doing training both in the district and in the community going forward, and we are hoping to, that, that by having this commitment to the website that we will be able to reduce our paper use and reduce the frequency of robocalls, which I think a lot of people will be thrilled about. I know I will be. Um, and in addition to the collaboration, the last thing I'll say, in addition to the collaboration with the administrators I mentioned, we also went to, I went to um, the CTE department at the high school to Noel, what's Noel's last name? I'm forgetting. Campbell. Noel Campbell, great guy. 
And Noel, I said, Noel, I hear we have some great photography students. What do you think? So I, I met, had a meeting with Noel and the head of the photography program two weeks ago, Chad Bui, Ubiwa. I never get that right. Sorry, Chad. And they are going to select some students to do the new photography for the site. So we're really, really excited about that. We'll be able to showcase some of our students' work, and they'll get some experience. And um, yeah, it's a win-win for all of us. So that's what's going on. I can take questions after Mike does a little driving around the site. But that's basically what we've been up to. We're expecting to launch, and I'm saying soft launch, but the first week of June. And then we will be doing a huge campaign, a communication campaign and training campaign, as I mentioned, in the community to teach parents how to use this, because this is where you will go to see your kid's report card. Two clicks. You can see your kid's report card. You can see what's for lunch. Yeah, that's um, and it will be up to date. So that's it. Over to you, Mike. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Miller. Um, yep, so I'm going to just take you on a little uh, test drive uh, through the site, and uh, I know that Trustee Miller already said that uh, it's under construction. It is very much under under construction. Yep, we said that, uh, you know, basically what we tried to do is we tried to start filling pages, and we started to uh, focus on uh, parents with, uh, you know, looking at them the most. So. I just wanted to kind of take a little little run through the home page. We'll go through a couple other pages. Um, so let me take a tour. Uh, obviously, you've got the district and the schools uh, at the top, uh, much like we do on our current site. Uh, but we have this nice little uh, navigation up here, faculty, student, parent, garden, guardian. So uh, if I'm a student, I can just click on this once. And you'll see up here uh, a bunch of boxes start appearing. And, um, you know, we've got the, our how-to videos. We've got MVP. We've got Schoology. We've got other resources, things like that. The next, we've got, like, our top-line navigation. So we, we have, like, six, uh, six pieces of our top-line navigation. Uh, what we tried to do was we tried to break it down into... Uh, the big thing is we broke it down into academics and departments. So uh, you'll see uh, our district. We've got like some of our traditional our district type of stuff under superintendent, you know, staff directory, board, board of education, things like that. Then next up we've got academics versus departments. So the departments are your traditional departments and school districts, academics is more on the academic side, obviously, like CTE, like the different types of programs that we offer, mm -hmm. STEAM, curriculum and assessment, things like that. Departments, we got the traditional ones, like I said, food services, athletics, all the way to school improvement, uh, school taxes, special education, things like that. Uh, family community, we've got, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we had from our family and community tab uh, on our current site uh, one thing that we uh, one thing that we know is that we can't make too many changes to this website without bringing along some of the string from the old site uh, because people are used to using the old site so we want to we want to bring some of that tradition stuff uh, as well we thought that it was important to put registration up here so we did that and here's our little surprise that trustee Miller was saying is we've got an what we call I want to so what we've got is a little bit of a preface to like different different questions or different wants that that parents and families would have. Uh, I want to attend a, attend a school board meeting. How am I going to do that? Where where do I go? I'll click right here. I want to contact the district. I can do it there. I can do it up here in the navigation. There's different areas where we can go. Uh, I want to rent facilities. I want to register my child. I want to swim at Mo uh, Mount Vernon High School. There's just a lot of different opportunities here. So uh, we tried to uh, give some serious thought as to what we thought parents and families would be interested in, and we, uh, we came up with those. So next up, uh, we've got our traditional slider. 
uh, but we've got a little a fun icon navigation down here. Um, so it's easy. These are going to be like one-click places. You can go to uh, employment, you can click on menus, you can click on, if you, again, if you're going to contact the district, you can click there. The calendar, it's also below, I'll show it to you in a second. Uh, COVID for now, and Facebook. So we, uh, we know that Facebook is, is definitely our uh, main social medium, and that's why Facebook's up there. Um, over here, scrolling through, we've got like a little bit of an, an ex explanation of our mission as a school district. Uh, we're going to be filling that. And we have a video sort of introducing people to, uh, to the school district. So this video is from 2020. Uh, we're going to need to update that. Uh, we'll probably bring in uh, Mike Thompson and his team. So there you go. Um, next up, school district news. Um, so this is just the top three stories. You can click over here for all district news. So we're going to start filling that soon. And then uh, this is an interesting feature. One of the things that we wanted to do, uh, everybody's looking at this quote and kind of like looking at it and saying, what is that all about? What we'd like to do is we wanted to make something that was unique to Mount Vernon and unique to the school district. We wanted to tell little stories of our alumni and the kind of the neat things that they're doing now or the neat accomplishments that they've made in their lives, things like that. We want to highlight some of our cool alumni. alumni. We want to highlight some cool things that are going on in the school district. So uh, we've got like a little uh, area to do that. Next up is the school district calendar. It's a little bit more visual than what we have currently. So uh, you can see that we've started to populate that. You can click on it to go to view all events. I'll just do a quick look. Uh, we just posted up some things on the calendar just so you can kind of get a feel for what the calendar page is going to be like. Um, so I will, yep, and we've got a printable calendar over to the right. Uh, so everything, we're, we're trying to make things a little bit more visual for people uh, as well. So we'll go back to the home screen. Okay. At the bottom, uh, we've got like our typical privacy policy, site map accessibility, et cetera. And here is another neat feature that Trustee Miller was talking about is our translatable function. So I can just take a page, I can click on it, translate everything to Spanish. And you'll see that everything comes up in Spanish for us. So I'll go back to English. Um, so I just wanted to uh, go through just a couple more pages. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, it's something that we're excited about, so we wanted to kind of show it off a little bit. So um, Trustee Miller had mentioned that we're starting to work with the school, uh, with Williams School. Uh, it's one school that we're using sort of as a template. Once we get that one down, we're going to uh, get working with the other schools. So um, the nice thing is, is that I've been spending a lot of time working with uh, the departments and working with uh, Williams School so far. So uh, the other schools, uh, you're not far behind. As soon as we get Williams School done, then we'll start working on, on the different schools. So... I'll just take you for a little little quick tour. It's a similar type of layout. It's got a video, uh, or it will have a video. That's basically just a placeholder. It's got a photo of the school. We're going to keep those uh, keep those quotes uh, from alumni. Uh, this will be a school-centric calendar that will be visual, and uh, that's about it for the home page. So, any questions? Not yet. Okay. All right. Well, it'll be too late when you ask. No, only kidding. And you said um, we're hiring a full-time person to. Yeah, we um, the posting. I, I put I put out the the uh, the job uh, listing to several people in our community. Everyone on the cable commission. Everybody I know in the community who's ever worked in video, TV, internet, whatever. Um, it's a full-time position. 
it's going to be an exciting position uh, and very dynamic. Uh, someone who is going to be able to reach out to the schools and make sure their stuff is up to date and be able to post, you know, actually load things onto this site, convert things, etc. Um, I asked uh, Ms. Tiggs this evening if we could post it on Indeed because I think that's a better place. It's not a civil service job. So I think Indeed is a better place to look for a webmaster. And I don't know how much it costs. I said, oh, look, I'll pay for it. I don't care. We just need to get somebody in here very quickly. So um, we will be hiring a full-time person, yes. I have some questions. Sure. Will this replace the app, the mobile version of this? I think the mobile version will replace the app. We're still trying to get the data. It's amazing how difficult it is to try to find out, like, how many people are using the app? How many people downloaded it? But the mobile, mobile version will have everything. You'll be able to get your push notifications right on your phone. So, uh, you know, that's part of the education campaign we have to do is to get people to. We're going to have posters around town with a QR code. You can just, you know, get that, and then all of a sudden you'll have it on your phone. Um, I understand the. we definitely need a full-time webmaster, and they're going to be doing things like updating the calendar, updating the board meeting minutes onto the website, right, and like when personnel changes and all that stuff. But do you contemplate that that person is also going to be tasked with like writing news headlines for the no, district? that's a separate So function. who does that? Well, right now Mike's doing that. Okay. His, Mike and his firm, he has a great firm, and he has uh, an, uh, uh, an associate, Ken Valenti, who's been going around to schools taking photographs. He's done a great job of placing uh, articles in the journal news and t television and other media. Uh, but no, that's this is this is more a um, what's the right word? Yeah, I mean it's just really website. It's not news. It's not communications. And we are still. Um, I am still interested in hiring a head of communications for the district. I agree, and and in particular, like look, our best news comes from the individual schools, right? right? The best PR we can have as a district is a success at one of the schools. A great activity, a great teacher, a great student performance, you know, right. somebody who gets into a great college, whatever it is, there, there's lots of great things happening. So the trouble that we always have, which this website is, is great and needed but will not fix, is how do we get all that great news out of the schools and onto the website? And the problem we will always have, or seem to have, and we need to find a solution for is we have all these great teachers, these great administrators, these great principals, they're busy. They're doing all their stuff all day long. They don't have time to also stay up late at night to write a press release about the awesome thing they just found out about their school. So I'm not, I don't have a solution. I'm just highlighting that this is a great platform. The main problem we have after this needed project is finished, it, they won't be this anymore. Right now we have a platform problem, which this is going to fix. Once we fix the platform problem, the next problem we have to address is the content. How do we get the great news that's happening onto the website? So, exactly. at the school level. No, you're exactly right, and that has been the problem. Because that's if you look at our current school site, individual school sites today, you'll see some that are incredibly populated and robust, and you'll see some that have a welcome back to school thing from last September. Exactly. Um, we also have a very... Um, very diverse, I shall say, uh, group of photographs of our building administrators um, and our uh, our head of photography uh, curriculum at the high school has offered to take headshots, professional headshots of everyone. But basically, on each school page, you, the principal will have their own message. We intend to shoot videos of each principal. And I know that there are many principals, uh, I know uh, uh, Mr. Gonz Dr. Gonzalez over here uh, sends a message to his school community once a week. This will be the place to do it. So the whole idea is we're not going to be doing backpacking unless we have to. We're not going to be doing robocalls. The main method of communication will be. So if principals, if building leaders want to communicate with their parents, they're going to have to use the website. So this is going to be part of a training, but we really need everyone to embrace this because this is the world. We're digital. Our students are digital natives. Right. I mean, some of us aren't, but our students are, all of them. So if, if we really want to communicate with them and their parents, we have to take this seriously and we have to say, we're not going to be sending out a ton of paper. We're going to be communicating through this. And that's why every building has its own channel to do this. So I agree. And part of what the webmaster has to do, 
and any other person who wants to be a web cop is to say, hey, this is, well, certainly the parent liaisons are going to do it. I have the commitment from them. Say, hey, this isn't up to date. Right. Post this. This has got to be up to date. And of course, the webmaster will be able to post things for people. So you can just provide it and they will post it also. Yeah, but, so, you know, you're right. That is, that's where the rubber hits the road. You're exactly right. Right. So I, I don't know if it means expanding the, the number or role of our parent liaisons. I don't know if it's add, put it well, on admin. Well, we have tech links. We have tech links. We're going to do some of it. At the high school level, maybe we can get some of the students involved in keeping, you know, news updated about what's happening in their schools. I, I don't know. It's going to take a combination of all things mm -hmm. to make sure we keep this populated because a great website is is dead it's three only months as good after as you content. make it. It's You're just right. dead. It has to be kept updated. My only te technical question, I'll have more comments, I'm sure, but um, searchability of the website. How is that, and this is maybe a too technical question to get into very deeply, but there are garbage search algorithms. There are websites where you search and you don't find anything. Right. So I want to make sure that we're using a very good search algorithm with the search function of the website. We are, and we're using advanced search. We're paying for advanced search, and we're paying for the latest algorithms. We're also paying for accessibility, so people with uh, vision issues, with any kind of issues, will be able to access the website. So we're really going state of the art with this, um, and hopefully it will be satisfactory. All right, and last comment. Please tell me, please tell me <laughs> that I understand there will be a transition period, but please tell me that at the end of this transition period, this will replace Blackboard, Schoology, robocalls, everything else, because I and, I mean, and every other parent are sick of every teacher having a totally different way of communicating with parents. Yep, Everybody got a different WhatsApp. Everybody got a different text thread. I got mm -hmm. Blackboard. I got some that are emails. It drives parents nuts. Mm -hmm. I'm, please, can we I, I'm not a, you know, let's consolidate this? <laughs> I know. All we can do is build the website and provide the tools to the teachers. Yes. It's up to the administration to work with the building leaders, to work with their teachers, to say, no, we're not using Class Dojo. We're I, using I mean, X, I only Y, or got, Z. I only got two kids in the same school. There are parents with three, four, five kids at two or three different schools. Right. And it's insanity. It is so impossible to keep track of it. Well, our goal is to reduce paper and robocalls initially. And then it will be up to the building leaders to work with their teachers uh, to make sure that it's utilized in the way it's supposed to be. And we, you know, we're actually replacing Blackboard with something called Infinite Campus, which is very cool, but that's a whole other subject. Um, just really quickly, what are we going to do to keep up with technology? Because you know, like, every, like, two weeks, all of a sudden, something is new and better. What are we going to do to keep up, you know, since we are such state-of-the-art? What are we going to do to keep up being state-of-the-art? We pay an annual maintenance fee. Okay. And so all the, the updates happen automatically. So we pay an annual maintenance fee through BOCES to Final Site, which provides all the updates in real time. Okie dokie, thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's participated in this project. It has really been hard. It's extra work for everyone who's, who's doing it. And we just have a great team, great ideas, great energy, and we're just hoping we can deliver. But as Trustee McGowan said, it's all about the entire community embracing this and all of us getting in and, and grabbing an oar and rowing and specifically at the building level. But I do agree with getting the students involved. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be presenting to the PTA Council, get the PTAs involved. It's, it's in their best interest to promote this because it'll help them get more engaged PTAs. I mean, the whole point of this is to encourage parent engagement and to make it easier for parents to get the information they need. So hopefully we'll, we will succeed at that because that is the goal. I'd like to also uh, just uh, take take the opportunity to say thank you for all the department heads, all the all the uh, administrators, uh, all the uh, principals and teachers that have, I've been working with so far. Um, it is a work in progress. Uh, you know what I'd like to do is I'll I'll keep uh, I'll keep working with you back and forth. 
and uh, it's it's not a final project yet, but uh, but yeah, we're shooting for the first week of June. Thank you. We'll be lived through you. it. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> what I can't stand is that you're still gonna have every time I get a message from the teacher, I gotta go to so, um, Is that it for that presentation? So we can go right into committee reports, correct? All right. Um, I'm ready. Any other questions uh, for Trustee Miller? All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, Trustee Turnquest on that side. So good night, everyone. Good evening. Past evening now. Thank you for all of the reports. Um, so I got opportunity on March 8th, uh, 2022, Tuesday, uh, to meet with the Education Committee. Um, Trustee Sorson uh, joined us. Um, we're talking about the IB program that we have here, the International Baccalaureate Program. Uh, that is also, just to let you know that that also, the International Baccalaureate Program also uh, taps into the multiple intelligences where students are allowed to exhibit their knowledge, especially when it comes down for them to be able to take a test. Or there's certain kinds of exams that they give in the baccalaureate um, international program. Um, there were 20 students there in year one, 18 students there in year two. Uh, the IB program uh, was initiated, initiated in 2016. Um, from 2017 to 2020, and then um, it was approved the winter of 2020. And last year, this time, exactly March 13th was when schools closed because of COVID. So that's March 13th, 22 year, two years? Yeah. <laughs> it's two years ago, y'all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so, so one of the things, um, I, I know that there's questions in regards to it. Um, I'll, I'll do the best with answering any of the questions. Um, uh, one, one of the things that was re reported was like the students who are in the IB program, they came up with, um, an understanding that there are some needs in our community and, and they have a community closet. And so one of the discussions was to actually have a community at the school, having a community washing machine and dryer, because if a school has a um, a percentage of absenteeism, a lot of times students are absent because their clothing are not clean, and if they're allowed to be able to clean their clothing on school campus, it also um, it changes the their attendances. Um, let me see. So. There are specific books that are used for the International Baccalaureate. Um, they are going to get me that list. They said that the list is very much different than other mm -hmm. programs and other curriculums. But um, what would be uh, good to know is that if we could also infuse those books in our other curriculums that we have. Um, I think, would you, would you like to add some things on? Oh, so um, remember that we're discussing also that even though right now we have take my wins, 15 full students enrolled in the program, we also have um, students taking individual courses mm -hmm. or one or two courses. Um, the other thing is that um, one of the goals of the program is to expand it to the other high schools eventually. Yeah throughout the years, and given the, the opportunities of the other students to take a, those courses, and at the same time, um, <coughs> all, uh, the, the students at the Marvin High School, you know, like do the AP courses and the I, IB courses, so, you know, kids to have an opportunity to take one or the other one or both. Um, oh, also, just to add on to that, where students usually, when they go into the IB um, 
program. They're doing it later on in their high school years, but uh, making it um, tempting for them to start in ninth grade or at least take one class to see how it goes. Because a lot of them have um, shared with uh, Dr. Bennett Conroy, like the first thing that they say that this is hard. But even with them saying that this is hard, they have not given up, right? And they have continued with it. And, uh, um, yeah. The, the teachers are, tra are trained in, in the IB curriculum where they have professional learning um, circles as well as they have professional developments that continue on. Um, and their curriculum is a living document. That means that it changes according to the needs of the 21st century students. Um, the other thing that I was going to say is talking about um, the differentiate, differentiated instruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the writing is pretty much justified, you know, it's pretty much asking students to their interpretation and that's what um, Trustee Tarquist shows was talking about, about tapping all into the multiple intelligences. It is not one answer, it is basically their answer. Um, and that's something that I really, really like. But one of the things that I was asking, I'm oh, sorry, one of the things that I was asking, that is weird, they asked me to talk more into the mic, <laughs> one of the things that I was oh, one of the things that I was asking is how are we going to roll the program to the rest of the school? How um, are we gonna modify the curriculum? Like what um, um, Trustee Tonkos just was talking about the books that they are using. How are we gonna roll it into the regular curriculum in order for us to encourage? those students that are not walking, you know, they're not on that track, to help them be on the track, at least for one course or two courses. They don't have to be just to become a full-time student, but at least to graduate from the high school with one or two courses, because IB program um, um, credits right now courses are definitely sore after more than AP courses by colleges. So that's one of the things on how can how are we going to do that? How are we going to incorporate both curriculums, you know, um, their curriculum into the regular curriculum so we could encourage kids to grow and by the time they graduate to be part of the IB program, at least with one or two courses, like I said. Yes. Any any questions? So, um, would it be okay if we get Dr. Gonzalez to come and talk about the IB program? Oh, sure. He's here. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez, if you don't mind. Thank you. How's that? Oh, the rigor. We've got to go up. The rigor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. So you hear there's been some discussion about the IB program, um, and I know you have IB as part of your background as well. So if you could just talk about how the program grows and the integration of the principles of IB instruction in other classes. Yes. So the full school vision is that we incorporate what are called IB approaches to teaching and learning into our instructional practices. And essentially, that boils down to student-centered by making sure that we keep the students at the center of the learning. So as we heard from both trustees, right, that is, is the approach of IB, which means we bring the student interest forward. So when students have to do a research project, they are given the skills to research, but ultimately it is their choice who they research. We have to stay in the bucket of the, the class, right? So we're not necessarily going to research a scientist in English class or vice versa. So there are, there are lanes, but we uh, help the students narrow their interest within that particular subject area. And that's why it's so much fun, because we heard from uh, Trustee Sorensen that when students take these exams, it's how they justify their responses, right? how they're able to make an argument using the, what they have learned as opposed to merely recalling what they have learned. So I need to know roughly when this particular event happened in history but I need to know how to talk about it in an intelligible way, responding to a question that I might not have seen in advance, right? The thinking on your feet, right? Because that's what's so much fun as someone I've taught in the IB program, right? It, getting students to learn on their feet because that's the skill of life, right? Um, we heard uh, talking about the, uh, the need for community service, 
right? Community service is the foundational spine of IB. So both within the community closet, right, which is an idea that came from students, as well as how can we use the current uh, washers and dryers to further facilitate that vision. So when we talk about IB in a nutshell, that's, that's where we're at, right? We're talking about student-centered instruction across the board. Uh, examinations that are written by hand as opposed to multiple choice and exams and assessments where students who might come up with different answers can also be right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? What, 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 what I like, um, what, what I need individuals to understand what we are talking about here. We are talking about where there, I just want you to know that there are schools that do not take the Regents exams and instead they present and they present on this level. And it's because they are able to, to present their thesis and they are able to defend their thesis why they are, um, that school in particular, whatever school that is, uh, shying away from taking the New York State exam where students are robots, okay? So thank you for noting that part in regards to students being able to exhibit their knowledge on point and not exhibit it from just A, B, C, and D. The, if I, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. I, if, so the, the goal for expansion is to uh, take that skill set, right, that demonstrating independent thinking, and make it palatable, right, ma make it accessible to students in 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, right? So that is the, the for all approach, and because it's not about how much a student does. Like, I can defend my argument with 2,000 words or with 20 words. Right? I can defend my argument with a 10-minute presentation or a T-chart right, that talks about similarities and differences. But it's the skill of presenting my independent knowledge that is fundamental. So as we work to embed these practices into Mount Vernon High School, and hopefully, as was mentioned, across other schools in the district, that's the work. Distilling it down, not making it any easier, but making it something that everyone can access. Okay. Um, no one is a bigger supporter, proponent of everything you just said. I, I was a scientist. I went to law school, Socratic method. I wish all learning was that method, right? All learning should be IB method. That's not the world we live in, unfortunately. Um, but I still haven't heard an answer to what I think is a very specific question, which is, how do we get from 18 kids enrolled in this program to a lot more than 18? I, and if you don't have an answer, fine, right now. But there needs to be a plan, a very specific plan for increasing the number of kids enrolled in this program because the costs per student are exceedingly high. And we all voted to do this program, and we were all behind it, and we're still behind it, I think. Um, and we understand there's always a ramping up period, and it's a it's a time of growth, and it's a big jump from what was there before IB to IB. So I personally am not expecting any miracle in a, a specific number of years, but there needs to be a very concrete plan of how do we get there. And if five years from now, we still only have 18 kids in the IB program, then some future board is going to have to make a decision about that, right, at a practical level. Yes, sir. And that is something that is, is the forefront of our conversations. So, and we do have specific ways we are addressing that uh, in the next, hopefully, two to four years. So, for the next academic year, for 22-23, uh, every arts class and, uh, a, and every business class we offer to students, thank you, sir, to students in grade 11 and 12 will be IB. And there will not be another option available to students. So, by default, they will have these classes. Now, that is not to say that all of a sudden we're throwing students off the deep end, right? Because these are two-year classes, we have a year to help students acclimate. Also, because this will be an elective for them, if they decide not to pursue the second year, that's their choice. We're not going to force, right? But we are going to invite students to have to elect out as opposed to having to elect in, right? So that is, that is phase one. Phase two is then making this experience into a core class the English class, where hopefully in a number of years, I don't want to give this board a set timetable, 
um, but soon, within five, that we have every student at Mount Vernon High School and hopefully other high schools, we can work out ways to invite them to participate, will take an IB English class for at least one year, if not two. So we will shift, hopefully, from, uh, as we look next year, to have approximately 415 students involved in the business class and all the arts classes to when we are able to have all of the students take one or two years of IB English, uh, approximately 497 students. So roughly 42% of the student body. So that, that, is, that is a long-term goal because as, as, as you get to know me, my goal is IB for all. Because I firmly believe that every child in this district, if not in this country, deserves the high-quality education that IB provides. It is not for some. It is for all. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Hold on, I'm Dr. Sorry. Dr. Gonzalez. No, I'm sorry. Really quickly, um, just to start, I think it's super to hear IB for all. Like, I think that is that's quite a goal, and I think it's really fantastic to hear um, because I think the problem that we run into, and I think it's worth saying um, because I think sometimes it seems like we're, you know, bashing the IB or we're bashing the arts or we're bashing whoever it is. It, at some point, there's a finite amount of resources, and at some point there becomes a, it's a, it's a game of what do we, what's more important, and that's why when we heard 15, I think everyone kind of, 15 students or 20 students, everyone kind of for a second sat back and said, oh my goodness, you know, because you don't want to lose anybody, right? And we want to make sure that everybody has the resources that they need. So my question, and this is why I think this came up, is the last board meeting we had a agenda item. And if we could have an idea of if this year we're doing four courses, how this cycle keeps continuing so we can have an idea in terms of a budget, I think that would be very helpful to us. Of course. Uh, so as was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the curriculum is, is dynamic. We are adapting. Um, when teachers were initially trained in the program, they wrote curricula that they had been enhancing over the, the two years of implementation. So whilst I don't have, in my head, I apologize, I don't have my notes, um, like the set number of classes, once we write thank you, <laughs> my notes emerge. Um, so, uh, so we have currently have nine IB diploma classes on the books. Uh, a couple of these classes uh, need to be added to uh, what is called Atlas Rubicon, which is where the district houses the curriculum, so we can ensure that students uh, receive graduation credit as well as our athletes receive uh, the, the, the particular credit when they matriculate to university. Um, so those classes are, we have the curriculum, we just have to put them onto this Atlas Rubicon. Mm -hmm. So that is the immediate local work. We then are uh, introducing five new courses next year, the business course, as well as four arts courses, music, theater, visual arts, and economics. So that curriculum is being written, uh, it's being drafted now, and then we would need to have faculty write that curricula um, before we get to June. So not the nine plus the five, so 14. So that's where we are. That's the current need as well as the future need. So just to be clear, there's the four that we are, that w that are up for <laughs> vote today, are part of the nine? I'm sorry, yes, I just want to yes, make sure we're Yes, you're all exactly right. Page. Yes, that they're, they're, they're can... part of the nine. Okay. The, they, they're part of the, the first order that, that we need to to just finish and upload. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, that, that, uh, Principal Gonzalez, the, you said we have nine IB courses, right? Yes. Which are the nine? Because I don't think we discussed that in the meeting. Uh, it, uh, 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 the nine are uh, language and literature. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the English class. Uh, the, the Spanish, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's two levels of Spanish there. The history of the Americas, economics, the sports, exercise, and health science, environmental systems and societies, uh, the math class, which is called uh, applications, mm -hmm. and then theory of knowledge, and lastly, creativity, activity, and service. Okie dokie. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Gonzalez? <clears throat> no. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Right. Gonzalez. Thank you very much. Have a good night. So moving on with the committee reports, uh, Trustee McGowan. I've got to Oh, she's still fin Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> she's not it's not going to take long. <laughs> 
So I just wanted to make sure that um, that everyone that is listening in regards to the charter schools that are on the slated to come to Mount Vernon, that we have to know exactly what we can do. And there are caps on numbers of charter schools. And there are specific caps. For instance, in Rhode Island, they could have no more than 35 charter schools, but they have to also make sure that they have a design uh, to increase educational opportunities for at-risk pupils, which is the beef with charter schools, where charter schools let at-risk pupils or pupils who have special needs go right around this time. So this is around testing time. This is when students start uh, entering into public school from charter schools because charter schools know that they may not do as well as they need them to do on the New York State exams. We're going to keep it 100, all right? So there is legislation, right? I just want everyone to know that there are a total of 460 charter schools that can exist in New York State. 290 of them are set aside for New York City. 404 have been approved to operate in New York State uh, year 2021, July. There can be legislation put in place to cease charter schools from coming into Mount Vernon. We just have to know how to go about doing that because there are caps. New York City has a cap. So we live in New York State, but New York City has a cap because they have a problem with so many charter schools that will be erected on every corner in Harlem, right? So I just want individuals to know who are listening that there is something that we can do, but we cannot do it in silo. Uh, Dr. Hamilton can't do it by himself. The trustees can't do it by themselves, but we have to do this together. So one more time, there is a cap that we can put on Mount Vernon, but we have to go about doing it the right way yes. so that we will not be the definition of insanity and do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Amen. That's the end of my report. <laughs> Trustee McAllen, Trustee Miller, you did your presentation. Uh, Trustee Sorensen. Well, good evening once again. Um, so we had an amazing meeting. Our, the, uh, our last meeting was awesome. We all left, you know, we were supposed to be there only for, what, half an hour? <laughs> we ended up being for an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 15, because we just kept on going and adding and sharing and putting our thoughts together. So we left, you know, extremely happy with our meeting. So, special, like, ed, oh, special ed meeting you're talking Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Like, I'm so excited to tell everybody, yes, the special ed committee meeting. So, um, so I just wanted to remind everybody that tomorrow will be our SEAC program and we will be um, conducting a parent workshop on how to understand your child's IEP. We went through the PowerPoint and our facilitator is phenomenal. She did a great job. Um, we will be, um, instead of doing the whole hour and a half of the presentation, we made a choice to make it an hour so we could have ha a half an hour for discussion and sharing and, you know, everybody will have an opportunity. We encourage the parents to please have questions ready so we could, you know, we were, you know, for us just to keep on going, keep it moving and keep it positive and keep it ready to go. Um, also, once again, we will be having our SEAC not movie night. And instead of doing it virtually, we decided that we're going to do it here in the fishbowl. And we, will, we are inviting people to come. It's an awesome, amazing movie. It's called, um, oh my God, now again, I forgot the name of the movie. Something with peanut butter. Something Thank you. Sorry. You know, after like 
50 blah, 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 years old. I'm having a lot of senior moments. Um, Peanut Butter Falcon. And it is an amazing movie. And it's a, and I'm recommending for people to come because it is a very positive, funny movie in which shows that our children, and I mean our because I everybody knows I have a special needs child, our children could do it all. Our kids could do it all. Of course, they have different abilities, but they could do it all, and it's a very positive movie. Trust me, you guys will love it. Um, we also discuss um, what, what's to come for April um, and May and June. Um, we, we have, I'm not going to say the other things that we're talking about because they have not come into fruition and we have to sit down and we have to talk everything else, but we are very, very excited for next year, um, because we're also planning to bring the Special Olympics back, right, for next year, so we are, I'm, I'm very hyped, I'm really, really hyped, so I don't know if, um, President Sanders wants to add on it, or Dr. Smith wants to add on, um, their little piece of... So the special education meeting is tomorrow, six nope. o'clock. Mm-hmm. Also, I forgot to get the time. And um, it's via Zoom, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So how do people get the invite to that Zoom? Um, it's on the website. Um, a robocall was made. And we will, um, I'm also, I'm going to do, uh, we're going to do another robocall tonight. And um, I'm going to do it in Spanish. And our beautiful, wonderful young lady over here will do it in English, so... And what about the movie night? When is that? Um, the movie night is on the 21st, and it's in commemoration of International Down Syndrome Day. March March 21st? March 21st, which is trisomy, trisomy 21, so that's oh. it's 321. Um, and we will be celebrating. And also, by the way, forgot to say, this month is also um, um, Developmental Disabilities Day, a uh, month. So we are also celebrating that. So, and anybody else? Like, I'm sorry. I'm just really hyped because I really enjoyed our last meeting. Great. Okay. So, you're done? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you want me to say? You're just like, you're just... <laughs> it's committee meeting. Trustee <laughs> John Aiden Wilson, do you have any reports? Oh. Uh, yes, I do have a report. Candace. Um, currently, I'm proud to say that, you know, students are happy. The morale, the overall morale has gone up. As people know, the boys, bat, you know, Mount Vernon boys basketball, they won Section 1 AA championship. So everybody is happy, you know. <laughs> Mount Vernon track team, they went ahead and they're now yes, all Americans. Yes, yes. So, yes, people are very happy. But also, I, I want it to be known that, um, during the next board meeting, my committee report would be a lot more serious. You know, it's come to my attention tonight, not just from, um, from the people that were speaking today, such as Mr. McDowell, but also people texting me, fellow classmates, that there is a serious situation at the Denzel Washington School of the Arts regarding the seniors. So I want you to know that over these next two weeks, I'll be talking to seniors on a daily basis. I'll be unbiased as I can be. I won't be talking to them as a senior. I'll be talking to them as a board member. And I'll be coming to you, hopefully, at the next meeting with evidence of what is going on, how the seniors feel about it, so you, can, so you can hear their voices. And if administrative oversight is needed, I hope you'll have good reason for it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you John Aiden. Thank you for doing that. Trustee Patterson? Um, I'm sorry, a question. Um, so uh, is, is the swim team still having the, the fundraiser, or is it over? Oh, no, no, because I know they had one recently. Oh, my goodness. I'm so mad. I'm sorry I didn't, we didn't push it forward. I'll actually be doing another one. I know they're currently having a swim club to teach people. Yeah. You know, also for lifeguarding as well. So yes. I'll actually end up doing another one. No, but can you talk a little bit more about the swim club? Uh, so yeah, the swim club is basically for students that don't know how to swim or aren't the best swimmers. You know, it's okay. You want all ability levels to come in, and we're going to teach you how to swim. We're going to make you a better swimmer. We're going to make you feel confident in, you know, the water. That's and also, we are trying to get people um, certified as lifeguards, right? Yes. Also, hopefully, getting people certified as lifeguards. You know, starting to train for this year is that next year during certification time, we'll definitely have a lot more, a lot more lifeguards working in Mount Vernon. You know, a lot of people, especially black people, do not know how to swim, so it's mm -hmm. very important for us. So, if anybody has any questions, please email me. <laughs> I'll be more than happy to direct you to the right person.
Well, on top of that, talking about SWIM, uh, Trustee Sorensen and I talked about drown proofing with the special needs students. Yes, so I forgot about that. We were going to talk to um, to the SWIM guy yeah. about trying to do that with our special needs kids. Because my daughter, um, we lived in Florida, she was drown proof. So, because everybody has pools and water, and mm -hmm. it's good to have, I mean, they can't swim, but they can just be drown proof. So, that's something we need to talk about. And also, it's a great source of extra um, PT for them. You know, my son, when he started swimming, taking swim classes, that's when he started walking, so. All right, so Trustee Patterson, do you want to finish it? You do your report, please? I'm feeling a lot of pressure to go quickly. <laughs> I can't tell if it's from you or my iPad that has 2%. Um, okay, so we met with the, um, the budget committee met today. And just to really quickly go over, last year, our two main goals were to increase our bond rating and then ensure that we protected our savings, which is the reserve funds. Um, I'm pretty happy to say we got our bond rating, and it's an A-plus with a stable rating. Yay. Um, oh, no, it won't. It, oh, it's not going to die? Fancy one. No. No, it's, it fits. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's, oh. I want to make an inappropriate joke somewhere. <laughs> okay, back to this. So um, in terms of this year's budget, I know that we finished defense rounds um, Dr. Hamilton was kind enough to say that. So we're in the process now of figuring out where we stand. And I think it's good for everybody, first of all, to temper expectations. Um, if we need to take a, or need to go out and ask for a tax increase, we will. Um, but let's all be real, we all pay taxes. I don't want to pay any more taxes than anybody else does. I sure don't want to pay any more than I pay right now. Let's be really clear about that. Um, and we were such great managers for so many years that we managed to pull 0% for a number of years. Um, two issues with that. Number one, as everybody knows, um, there's inflation issues right now. There's the, it, the dollar just isn't the same as it was before. Um, and number two, and I think this is slightly more important, we were discussing the BCS. And the BCS priority one and two, from my understanding, are $27.5 million of repairs. I don't, I, I find it hard to understand how people complain about the buildings, but then complain that they don't want to pay more in taxes, or they don't want to pay, we don't want to take out a bond. I understand that bonds are not fun. They are not sexy. They, nobody wants to defend it. I get it. But the fact of the matter is this. We're going to need a bond at some point. Let's all be entirely clear about that. It's not a popular comment, but it is a necessary one. The fact of the matter is, we have $27.5 million of priority one and two. Those are life safety issues. Those are safety issues for the children, your children that are in the buildings. That we could, right now we actually did the math, um, Ken Silver was kind enough to do the math, and we can actually borrow around double that right now or this within the next year and still not have to raise taxes. So it's either we're gonna have to raise taxes and figure out how to fit capital projects into the budget that we have now, or we're going to have to ask for a bond. I don't see any other way. Again, unpopular position. I understand that. But we need to get this stuff handled. Um, just start thinking about that. Start thinking about the fact that we're going to have to go out. If we do want to borrow this money, we're going to have to go out soon. Um, and the fact of the matter is, again, remember that if you change... Po uh, and one of the examples that was given was when we updated all the boilers. Well, if you update a boiler... There's old pipe coming on, on one side and there's old pipe on the other side. So it's not just, sometimes it's not just a priority one and two because that priority three issue may also be affected if you fixed the one or the two. So it's not 27 and a half million even. So I would say conservatively, I think you're looking at 30, 35 million dollars that we're going to need. And Mount Vernon is not a district where we have land that we can just say, hey, we're taking that piece of land, we're gonna build a new school there, and then we're gonna knock the one next to it down and make it green space. We don't have that ability here. So we, I think we have to start thinking, and this is, I hate to punt it to other people, but um, I think we're gonna have to start getting a little more creative on buildings and grounds to figure out, do we have other options? Is there something else we can do? It's just, we're really in the position, that, again, where I just, we've been so, proactive with our budget. We've been so proactive with our spending. Um, we currently, we were in a deficit for fund reserve last year. Um, and this year we're almost up to where we legally, as much as we can legally hold, which is fantastic. Cause again, that's our savings. That is our 
in case of emergency, break glass. That is not, we shouldn't be using the fund reserves to offset budgetary issues. So just something, again, to think about when we're talking about what are we willing to go out for? Are we willing to go out with zero? And I would remind everybody that last year, we left, the, at least I left the meeting because I did the presentation. Um, I left the meeting with the understanding and the way that we spoke about it was, we don't want to ever have a point where the community gets hit with a three, four, five percent increase. That's insanity. You don't do that. If you can avoid that, it is fiscally irresponsible to hit the public with tax increases like that. Whereas if we, and this is what we discussed last year, we were talking about doing a gradual small increase. We did half a percent last year. We were talking about doing, you know, half or a qu uh, three quarters of a percent this year. And then do a gradual, hey, not trying to choke the public, but just trying to make sure that we can continue to educate our kids. So just something to think about. I have a question. No. <laughs> I knew that would be the answer. <laughs> no, um, actually, it's it, well, it's for you. It's for I guess for uh, Mr. Silver, and that is if uh, Dr. Hamilton laid out the budget approval schedule, and if we're supposed to vote on the budget April fifth, when are we all getting copies of the budget? I always get an entire copy. I don't want a summary. I want the entire budget. When are we getting that? Um, as trustees, so we can go through it because some of us do go through it line by line. I do too. And that, and that's only two weeks away. So, and so, Mr. Silver. Mr. Silver. Good evening. I would say that uh, we would have a complete ready-to-go budget within uh, seven days. So that gives us like five days to review it. Okay, that's crazy. Possibly we could push that. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying I want to make sure that we all have a chance to do our due diligence before we vote on this. And, and now that some interesting things have come up tonight about additional programs we're interested in, and we, there's a lot to consider. Yep. We have a few decisions to make internally, and then I think um, we'll be ready to pack this up. Um, Thank you. Mrs. I, Silver. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Mrs. Silver, in, in regards to the schedule for how soon we, what's the normal time frame when you receive the budget? Because I don't remember it being only a five-day window to review. Earlier, in earlier years, we were able to provide it earlier, but our defense rounds were late this year for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And so we just finished with the building principals defending their budgets. Uh, we did make some modifications today. Dr. Hamilton and I reviewed it today. We're going to be reviewing it in the next couple of days with other administration. Mm -hmm. And we expect to be able to pack this up sh shortly. We, we are later than we would like to be. Okay. But we are ready to catch that up. Uh, and we will be ready to answer questions individually even before we make any budget presentation. All right. So now I'm going to echo with Trustee Munoz Patterson because we've talked about the BCS and the $59 million, 27.5 of it being priority one and two. We've also had the discussion about um, <clears throat> the fact that those ones and twos sometimes cannot be touched until threes and fours are have to be settled as, at first. Um, can you speak to how the bond affects the taxpayer? Because I was also here last year when we talked about the gradual tax increase because the zero tax idea was pressed last year. And it was pressed by a certain, a certain, a certain part of people who definitely are here. They, they have reason to, uh, to feel the way they feel. I, have, I am a taxpayer. My mom is a taxpayer, senior citizen, fixed income, so I know what it means. But we really have to be fiscally responsible. That's what our job is here. And we cannot, of course, we can't condone a 0% tax increase and say, hey, let's spend what I told you before last time I talked about it, the roof fund. The money for the roof, that's what the fund, the fund uh, balance is. We can't spend the savings account that we normally would spend to, you know, to stop the roof from caving in because we don't want to give tax increases. We, we, you can't, you got to think about it. Zero percent, we, we do fractional increases now and, or do zero now and give everybody a tax increase of up to five percent in two years. What will it be? So uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but let me, let, me try to, let me try to speak to the overall picture. We, we have calculated with our financial advisors that we can do about $59.6 million with no increase in tax. So people will disbelieve that, but let me go back. 
We did the energy performance contract for $45 million with no increase in taxes. We did the $108 million bond with no increase in taxes. So when our track record since this administration started is almost no increase in taxes, and we've had 150 or $160 million in bonds with no increase in taxes. So we are telling you we can do this again. Right. But perhaps 59.6 is more than the board could, could tolerate. Mm -hmm. But if we had no increase in taxes on the budget, and we did a budget vote in the fall, we would have no need for money for almost two years. And by that time, our current debt service would be reduced substantially. Okay. And we would be able to do pretty much whatever we wanted to with no increase in taxes. Just like we said six years ago, there was no increase in taxes. Right. Now, for the bond dollars that are spent, is there a way that the public can see how every dollar of a bond was spent because the conversation that's constantly outside in the street where's the money i heard the money i heard we got money how come i don't see it so you're speaking of the 108 million dollar bond speaking of any of the bonds we, we'll talk about other money later but let's talk about that would it normally be some place that the public can find and see it because you, if you can't see the orange you can't know it's an orange there we can make it so they can find it yes so, we have all, right. all those documents. We just could easily put it together into a small presentation, which could go on the website. We could do here. It would be, it would be very that simple. That's key. To us asking for any bond, we have to 110% prove without a shadow of a doubt that every dollar that we've asked the public to vote on for a bond has been spent to better this district. Otherwise, it's, it's almost like going back to ask them. So it's, it's, it's pretty clear since we've had no, we've had almost no tax increases in eight years and we've had $160 million in bonds. It's pretty clear. And we've got we can demonstrate that. I uh, get you. And we got buildings on the south side that are crumbling. Yep. And that's why we need most, that's why we need that $27.5 million to start with. And you're right. We can't do some of the one and twos without doing some of the threes, which are ancillary portions uh, of those projects. Yes. Can, can I just ask a follow-up question? Because I, I think uh, I'm going to rephrase, I think, a question Warren just asked, because I didn't hear a clear answer. Um, I, I, and I get the accountability thing. And that's the whole point and advantage to the community of doing a bond versus a tax increase is when you vote for a bond, it locks in what you spend that money for. You have to spend it for that money. You're not allowed to spend it for anything else. So it locks it in. That's the advantage of doing a bond from a community member's perspective, right? You, have, you, you know what you're voting on, and it's for that purpose, right? My question to you is, which is a rephrase, I think, of Warren's question, just help me understand fiscally, like, how does it affect us? Let's say we need $50 million. Is it better for us as a district to say, let's raise taxes to get $50 million worth? Or do we say, let's go get a $50 million bond? So help us understand just how does, what is the difference to the community and why should they care one way or the other which way we get those funds? So unless you had a super majority, the most you could raise your taxes would be 2% in any given year. Sure, right. And right. so that would give us very little towards any major capital projects. Let, let me phrase it differently. Let me phrase it differently. If we say we need X dollars, and let's say, I'm just making up a number, a 1% tax increase for each of the next five years, just making that up. That's a set amount of dollars you could figure out, right? What is the advantage of doing it that way versus doing a five-year bond for that same amount of money? So 1% tax increase in the next five years would be about a $6.5 million, $6 million total increase over the five years. Okay. And you would then have taxes, which would be 5% or 6% higher every year, compounded every year. Right. On a bond, with, with the debt service decreasing, you would have no tax increase. And we could achieve all of these things in five years, whereas if you did it with a budget, you could achieve what one, less than one quarter of the immediate projects that must be done in five years. We could do them all in five years if we did a bond. Right. So th this is the point I'm trying to make clear for everybody, right? That economically speaking, for the same dollars, you get way more bang for your buck if you do it as a bond versus raising taxes. Is that accurate? Yes, and there would be essentially one bond, but before that, there would be what's called bans or bond anticipation notes before we actually did the bond yeah, itself. Yeah, now we're getting the details. Yeah, that's yeah, in yeah. the weeds. But I understand. Okay. I have a question. I'm sorry. Um, and please pardon my ignorance since I am the new kid in the block. So the bond it is basically a loan. Right? It's basically a what? A loan, a loan. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, and that basically is a loan. Is there a percentage that we have to pay of that loan back, and how are we paying it? Please educate me, because I... Yes, I bonds, bonds for renovations mm -hmm. are 15 years. So we would be paying it back over 15 years. We don't know exactly what the interest rate is, but our financial advisors were very conservative in their projections of what the interest rates would be. So if you did new construction, that's generally over 20 years, but renovations are over 15 years. So usually it goes by, okay. Right, and each year our current debt service goes down substantially, mm -hmm. which makes up for the, what we would need. And we would not need any money until at least the 23, 24 year, possibly later than that. You have to go through the planning, the architectural design, okay. the state education department has to approve it, and then you go ahead. So a, a vote before December of this year, the earliest anything would start would be at least the end of 23. Okay. Okay, so, so our, I know we currently, we just, had, we just had a bond, how many, a year ago, two years ago? Six years, Six years ago. So we are paying one now. We're in the process of paying And we're also, we're still paying off the bond from the year 2000. Holy moly. And we have other bonds, something called an Excel bond, which was $20 million. And you may not know it, but we did discover some unspent money from the 2000 bond uh, that Dr. Hamilton and I found. And we were able to get state aid on that money and do work at Thornton that had not been done that was supposed to be done. Okay, okay. I just needed to know because I was not, I'm not knowledgeable on that. But let me ask you a question, and I'm, and I'm sorry. Um, and this has nothing to do with a bond. So he said, we're talking about money and everything else. And now, disrespect Dr. Hamilton, but why are we spending then so much money on, on, the, on, the, on the reading fair? Like, I don't get, and then and once again, once again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have one. And I'm not sure of the amount but it's just, I just need, once again, clarification. I need, because we're talking about all these monies that we need. We're talking about all, you know, that we are needing this, we are needing that, and we're talking about tax increase. And I know that makes my blood, you know, a little bit chilly because I'm already paying a sugar load of taxes, like all of us here. I'm just worried that, we need, uh, we need to start prioritizing because things are getting, you know, kind of tight with everybody's pockets. And like I said, no offense, no, please don't take it the wrong way. I just need to know, I'm not saying we shouldn't have it, but I just need to know how much money we're spending and if we could minimize, you know, the, 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 the money that we spend to be utilized in something, you know, more practical. Over, you the, the, I, I believe you're talking about the reading challenge that yeah, we're, reading challenge. I'm that sorry, we're having I'm sorry. in the spring. I, my apologies. The reading so challenge, yes. I don't know if you, you, I don't know if you were present at the reading challenge we had before COVID. It was a day-long field day with activities and excitement and bicycles being given away, and the children were so excited. Mm -hmm. It was a, a huge cultural educational event for our kids. It was worth every penny that we spent on it. We had people on stilts. We had games, we had okay. food. It was a wonderful activity, as good as any activity we could do. And it involved the entire community, not just, not just the kids. And it was a really special day that we did that. Unfortunately, we couldn't do it the same way in years after that. But it was well worth the effort and the money. Now, some of that money also comes from uh, what's called a bullet grant, or grant money that comes uh, from one of our legislators. So that isn't all out of our general fund from the taxpayers. Some of it is subsidized by outside sources, which makes it much less. But the, um, the day, the field day is just a wonderful day. But I think and her question the was, were, well, how much did we spend on it? Donated. Yeah, how much did we spend on it? Well, all, the, all the prizes were donated, but yeah. the, yeah. the question how much, was, how much, how much are we cost? spending on our right now? Like, the question. Because that was the other it's thing. Back you back know, back. like, last, the last one that we had, we started in September, right? Like the reading challenge started in September. So we were trying to track, you know, really encourage it. And like I said, please don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking it. I think that we should, we should have something because the kids deserve it. They need to blow off some steam and have fun and, you know, be with a community. But I need to know how much are we spending, you know, in, 
we don't like you know you know I'm just gonna put it this way. I cannot make an extravagant birthday party for my oldest because my pockets are a bit tight. So I think that that's what I'm trying to say. You know, right now we have so many more urgent things to do. Well, right, we we don't yet have a price on okay. the the um, attractions. Okay. So I don't have that number, but I do know it was budgeted. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I believe it was. I don't want to make up a number because somebody will throw it in my face later. <laughs> BC has it. BC has it. Oh, BC, you have it? It's covered in the ARP. Awesome. For this year, it's $207,000. Okay. We have budgeted for that in the ARP, but I don't think it's going to take all of that money. No, I think last year, again, I don't want to speculate. No, I'll get yeah. back to you with the accurate number. All right. Plus, any will post that money. Okay, so um, does that conclude your you voted on the report? Okay, okay, yeah. No, I, I, no, I just needed to know. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to deviate no, time I, I I, because I, I'm just worried. I'm sorry. I'm just worried. All right. So that's not the issue. The issue is $9 million. Trustee Red doesn't have a that's committee report. Oh. Trustee White, do you have a committee report? Uh, I, I, we met, I met with the, um, the Columbus School... Uh, PTA, parent liaison, principal, uh, and renaming committee. We got some feedback from the uh, PTA's parents community that uh, we recently communicated that the Columbus School would be changed to the CARES Academy, which uh, was in line with the acronym for what the children's motto is in that school. Uh, we got feedback that the community really did not like that name. Uh, so we had an emergency meeting this past Thursday where we uh there were polls taken outside of the uh that meeting uh the PTA and the uh the committee took polls from the neighborhood the people in the neighborhood and the parents community they had several different names that they liked and they landed on Mount Vernon Leadership Academy for Columbus so that will be the new name for Columbus School and, and I want to say that this is huge. I don't know if it's really, if we're looking at how big this is. The schools are naming, you know, homeschool uh, being, you know, renamed the Honor Acad the Honors Academy and now Columbus School being named, renamed the Mount Vernon Leadership Academy. Uh, to change the school name is not a small thing. It's a huge thing. But the reasons why we're doing it is, is not because, oh, you know what, I have nothing else to do at my time. You know, I'm going to play some Call of Duty and then I'm going to change the school name. No. This is about building a future of what your what our students are going to think about and connect themselves to for the rest of their lives those kids that helped create and come up and agree on these names they're going to run this school board and sit in my seat at some point later down the line they'll be able to attach themselves with a school name and a mascot and school spirit that they weren't able to when they were thinking about the fact that it's named after some person that they have no clue who it was and and that person is no longer generations away and have no understanding. It's just it's just an empty name. So that's where we are now. I'm glad to say we finally got there. We're at the twelve, the eleventh hour with getting this information over to the state after we resolve today. Um, and I'm going to take questions now from anybody on, who has questions. If I can just jump in, mm -hmm. um, Trustee Sorensen. I'm tr pardon me, Trustee Mitchell. Um, Dr. Gail White Wallace just texted me. It was forty thousand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So when when the um the school names are changed, there are a plethora of individuals who already attended those schools and graduated from those schools and have diplomas from those schools and memories of that school name. Yeah. What can be done to have that memorialized so individuals who went there won't feel a type of way? The reason why I say this is because, so it's no uh, surprise that I didn't go to any schools in Mount Vernon. However, every single my ele elementary school and 
my high school are closed. And so there wasn't any kind of closure and there wasn't any kind of respect to the individuals who graduated and those schools are now closed. And so there needs to be something, some kind of, just put that in your, you know, just, you know, let the committee know on what, what is done in that aspect. I, I received some questions asking, you know, why was homes closing and I was able to give answers, but um, they did not say, well, you know, it closed now and then later on they might tell their grandchildren or something like that. I went to home. <coughs> can, I, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Can I jump in? Um, as Trustee Mitchell said, renaming a building is a really big deal and we should take every opportunity to make it a big deal and publish it. And this is a fantastic opportunity to reach out to all alumni, yes, including alumni of that school, and explain to them, we changed the name of this school and this is why. And if you want to be involved in the Leadership Academy, if you want to contribute to the student fund, if you want to come back and mentor a student just like you were mentored, this is a great opportunity for you to come back and be part of, of the new vision of this school. Um, I think a letter like that, and where you invite them, you don't need to apologize for naming, renaming a school. And by the way, I'm sorry if, if, if you're that broken up about like what elementary school you went to. You got other issues, but what I really want to hear from you is not a complaint. What I want to hear is how are you going to help? How are you going to contribute? What are you going to give? That's that's the response I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear your complaint. I want to hear how can you help make it better. So, in other words, try to find ways to reach out to former alumni of those elementary schools and present to them the i the first of all the idea and reasoning behind the renaming, and then try and then partner with them as to how they can give back to what... Yeah, it's great. Is. Let's have a ribbon cutting. Let's have a press release. Absolutely. Come back and speak. Yeah. Talk about your experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And have some guest speakers. Yes. Yeah. How far would you go back? I mean, they changed Rebecca Turner. Yeah. <laughs> um, I heard nothing. About... As long as, as, long as you've been... Sir, Wanda, as long as you've been here, that's how long I want to go back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ten years? Ten years. Ten years ago? <laughs> No, but I, they never reached out to us. I know, I know. From Longfellow. That's right, that's right. Me neither. And I am a Longfellow graduate, too. I refused to call it Rebecca Turner for many years. I was very spiteful. But, <laughs> no, but I understand. And I'm going, to, I'm going to bring that to the uh, committees uh, tonight via email, and uh, we're going to try to get some, uh, dig some people up to I went to home. home school. Hmm? I went to home school. Uh, would you be a guest speaker when we do the renaming? You just volunteered yourself, Adrian. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Madam President. We appreciate you on today. That's all I have. Nothing for facilities. I didn't do anything with facilities these past two weeks. Uh, I got, I got things to do in the next couple of weeks, though. I'm already planning some visits. The visits are based on the conversation that I had with Trustee Sorensen over at the high school. So, so it was not, by the way, sorry, it was not something planned. It was just that I um, heard, you know, once again, being the new kid on the block, I heard that I, at the I, high school. Can, can I stop you for one yeah, of second? Of course, of course. I'm sorry. Before you go into any of the details of what we discussed, let me go to the building. Of course, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 I got you. I got you. Guys, I got you but bro. If you say anything right now that relates to any of those topics, right. it's going to stir up something that we can't even substantiate and get in front of to repair and, and fix or address beforehand. I'm just, I'm just asking if you. If you could not, if you could refrain from sharing the details before oh, I could get Okay, okay, okay. No, okay. If you, if you want you. me to refrain, I could. I appreciate you. Okay, okay. I respect that. So, um, Mike Thompson just informed me that uh, the, can you hear me? That the games that are streaming at the Glens Falls Arena, you have to pay $11 in order to get the link. Is that right, Mike? All right, so um, if anybody is trying to, um, wants to stream that link, you have to 
pay eleven dollars for like four days, Mike? It's month to month. Month to month. Okay. So just so yeah, just so you know that you know you just can't get on the link. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, because we were able to stream the other yeah. games oh, before I'm that. For the drive into Glen yeah. Falls. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other thing I have, as far as um, um, a committee report is that I, I became aware that we have a consultant um, signing uh, documents for the facilities department that I think is uh, unacceptable. So I'm asking the board to support me to cease on that contract, and I'm asking um, and I'm asking trustee. Um, Mr. Silva, and I, and I want Amy to give me, um, I have it written down, um, trust, what, trust. what vendors were paid from this person, what vendors were paid, what budget they came from. I want to know what vendors they were paid, what vendors were paid, what budget they came from, and, um, how much were we, how much were paid to the vendors and where they were paid? So I need a list of vendors. I need how much they were paid, when they were paid, and what budget they came from. Okay, and I need that by Friday. Thank you. Okay. Secondly, I've, I've heard there were a lot of issues with special ed, and I know Trust, um, Ms. Smith spoke about that earlier, that she's trying to do the compensatory services, but we had a discussion that when we use TAs and we pull them out of class, we pull the TAs from their one-on-ones or whatever programs they're doing with special needs to teach a general ed class, then we're not in compliance with the state law. So I need to know if we should hire more TAs. You know, are we going to hire more TAs just to have TAs on hand to use to to um, to use as substitutes for these classes because we can no longer um, use TAs to teach a class. And I know we are supposed to teach them. I, I think we approved to teach them for 40 days or no longer. Is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, what you're referring to is the absenteeism of some classroom teachers mm -hmm. and. When teachers are absent, you, the board approve TAs to substitute. They substitute in the class, and yes, when, when they substitute, they, they are removed from their assignment. Well, that's what we're going to do. Um, when we spoke earlier, you spoke about a particular school, and since yeah, we spoke, to, um, that school had a, a, a teacher that basically... Um, delivered early, went out on maternity leave, leave earlier than expected, and another teacher who resigned from his position. We were able to find a substitute for one of them. We're hopeful that we'll find another substitute for the other one until the position is filled. At this particular point, um, the principal has been interviewing and is hopeful to replace the teacher that's gone. I think that's a district-wide issue, though. I think we're pulling TAs, initially we're pulling TAs all, all the time to teach classes, and, you know, that, that hinders the special ed students, and that, so they're not getting the services that they deserve. So I think that at some point we need to figure out how we can fix that. Maybe we need to hire more TAs just to do substitute teaching. So well, we do have a shortage of substitutes. Um, you know, we recruit it for substitutes, just like we recruit for people to work after school. We've had some difficulties. And so the, in the absence of substitute and trying to find a solution, they're relying on um, the, the TAs to cover. Understand. I mean, I know we're short teachers. I mean, the whole country is short of teachers. Correct. You know, I understand that. But I, I think we can probably <clears throat> get some TAs. Is that right? So it, it's, can I just, can I help? Sure. So it, the same way that it's difficult to get some teachers is the same way that it's difficult to get some TAs. I don't know if that's what, true, though, Ms. Turnquist. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, do we get more TA applicants than we do teachers? Yes. 
it is a little easier to get teaching assistance because the requirements are not as stringent. Correct. But as you said, there is a shortage of teachers across the country. There's a shortage of substitutes. So the plan is never to pull the teaching assistance. But what happens is very often, especially at the high school level, there will be a teacher in the class, a teaching assistant in the class. You don't have a substitute for a class. So the option then begins, becomes, do I leave the kids alone or do I leave the classroom teacher with the students and allow the teaching assistant to cover for today? And because teaching assistants work a little more, they're not always pulled from their total workload at the secondary level for the entire day. So they may go back and forth. And typically, principals try to use a classroom TA and not a one-on-one -on -one TA. But it is a last resort. It's never the plan. I have a question. So you have a class, you have a teacher, and you have a TA in the classroom. And so you pull the TA and put the TA to sub for a class. Wouldn't it be better if you was to take the teacher and have the teacher sub for the class and let the TA stay in that classroom that they are in? I'm not real clear in terms of your question, but it's typically the teacher that's absent and the teacher assistant becomes the substitute in the class. Ah, okay, good. So is there any monetary, um, anything monetary that goes along with that? Yes, there is. All right. The teacher assistant receives seventy-five dollars in addition to their salary. I got you. All right, good. Just making sure. I'm sorry, really quickly. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, the, the, the issue that they're talking about is a major, major issue that everyone is going through throughout uh, public schools. Well, you know, schools. Period. But and that's what usually happens. What happens is that that TA then becomes the teacher, and they get compensated for that day. But the other issue is, though, we're putting TAs in special ed classes, and they're not really certified to do any special ed classes. That's a problem. So can I address that? In regards to the teacher and assistants, particularly um, teacher assistants that work with an autistic population, we train them. They get a lot of training. And so oftentimes it makes better sense to use those teacher's assistants that's trained to work with that population than even to get an assistant coming into the building. One of the problems that we also encounter, um, there are substitutes that do not want to work in the cohort program. So you, you, you have the teacher's assistant that we train, they could, that, that much more experience in terms of working with that population. Can I ask a really quick question? I'm sorry. I know at some point, Ms. Tiggs, that we had a conversation about substitute teachers and the our rate versus the city's rate, considering I can probably spit to the city. Um, are we competitive? Are we not competitive? I don't I don't remember the what the outcome so of that conversation New York was. York City, I think, is at 199 a day. But if you recall, we were at 145. And when COVID hit, we went up to 175. But if you are a retired teacher from the Mount Vernon City School District, where in the past you had to work consecutive 40 days mm -hmm. in order to get a higher rate of 279.06. Also with COVID, for the last two school years, we also passed a resolution to pay any retired teacher from the school district 279.06 a day. So both our 175 is higher than most surrounding Westchester districts. It's the one thing we pay more than. And then <coughs> for the retired teachers, it's extremely competitive when they will come in. It's been difficult a little bit with COVID because a lot of people who are retired don't wanna, didn't wanna come in. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, um, I don't know, more of a comment. Oops, sorry. I have more of a comment. Um, I don't think that this problem is going to be solved, and I'm talking about nationwide, anytime soon. Um, and it's not a comment, it's a suggestion. The same way that we have a program in which we encourage our teachers to become administrators, I think that we should look into 
two different things. Number one, encourage our community parents to have a program in which we could help them become TAs and we could keep the jobs here within our own community. And then number two, have a program in which we help TAs become teachers. Because we have wonderful, wonderful TAs out there. They're young, they're vibrant, and they want to keep on working, they want to keep on going. Why not have them become the teachers? They already have the expertise in the classroom as a TA. I think it would be very advantageous to do so. Um, also, encourage the parents, the community members, help them out. You know, a lot of people are looking for jobs. So why not help them out to become TAs and then we also push them through the system for them to become our future teachers. I'm just putting it out there because we need to figure out a way to solve this. I agree. So are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Trustee Sorensen, anything from you? Oh, well, um, sorry. So. This is uh, something that it was um, addressed to me today, and I really want to sit down with you, um, Dr. Kim, to talk about it. Um, I just promised that I was going to address it, but I just want to say that I want to sit down with Dr. Kim to discuss it, because we... Um, for example, like it's a very long list, and I'm trying to cut it down and be short. Like every year, the autism cohort were given a catalog to choose supplies, um, and and we like to make a, you know to make a list to fulfill this stuff. Now it's not being done. Um, that the children, you know, are we have children that are needing um, adaptive furniture, and like, you know, wiggle chairs and stuff like that, and, and we're not doing that. And um, the only reason why I'm mentioning this is because I promise I was, but it's something that I want to address with you, give you an opportunity to address these points. Um, I apologize. I'm sorry. Are we still on committee reports? Yes. I'm not trying to be cute. I just feel like we kind of started to derail. Oh, well, I think that we just went all over the place right well, now. Well, that's why I'm... I, no, I'm sorry. If I, I had an I Elmo, if I, I had just, an, if I had an Elmo, I'd be. I don't know. Elmo, Elmo. okay. But she's so. still talking about her special ed. I okay, think so we're back forgot. to that. I'm, I'm just okay, checking. Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. My bad. It's just that I forgot because I got so hyperactive with how happy I was with the do I need committee to meeting. To so do do can I do this? Or no? send Mike's okay. I don't want to. You know what? You know what? I'm just gonna wrap it up because it's already ten o'clock, and I hope you guys don't mind. I would like to address this with Dr. Kim. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, right. so thank you. Just because, you know, since you brought it back to me like that. So, okay. so um, yeah, I just, I just want to address it with you, Dr. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know if um, Mr. Silver heard me because I think he was in the bathroom. Did he get, did he, does he know what I requested? Okay. All right. So, um, so does that conclude committee reports? Yes. All right. So, we're going to have a. Yeah, no, all, right. <laughs> all right. So, let's start with our meeting here. You want to do uh, uh nah, never mind. Shut up. No, I, I, uh, I have a concern. Um, I, I have a, I just want, I just want to say anything. You know, we, we have all these, we're spending a lot of money on IB. We're spending a lot of money at STEAM. You know, I see some of the STEAM kids are going on a trip. What are the high school kids doing? Why don't we have some kids at the high school doing something? What's going on? I don't think I understand. We, we, just, we just approved $17,000 for an IB program. We just approved the whole $17,000 for Denzel. What are we talking about? And we have nothing that we are offering Mount Vernon High School students other than that IB 20 kids. So what are you doing, about trips or programs? Trips, anything. Or? I mean, what are, what are we doing for them? I'm just, you understand what I'm saying? That's, that's, I'm just, did you hear what I said? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm having a, I'm having, what are we talking about? I'm sorry, I was having a side conversation with oh, Dr. Okay. Hamilton, but I said that we are just approved $17,000 for 
uh, the, the um, STEAM Academy, not for the STEAM Academy, for, with the STEAM Academies going on the trip, IB program, we're giving them a whole lot of money. Denzel Washington, we're giving them a whole lot of money for a performance. What are we doing with Mount Vernon High School students? Mount Vernon High School students. What have we done for them? I don't know. I mean, maybe it is. We have the principal here. Yeah, last meeting. Does that come from the building level, those suggestions? Well, I'm just putting it out there. Well, I, I, okay. All I'm saying, I'm just. So it's not something that the board. No, has to I'm just. It just. It was no, just, just, asking, just happened to be. We're spending a whole lot of money right here on this on today, and we have nothing for Mount Vernon High School. Yeah, I was wondering what I did. Okay. No, I so we can move on. Let's. Schools we don't have anything for today either. I'm talking about the high schools. You know? I, I, I have to say that um, I, I'm optimistic about the direction we're taking with the CTE program. I'm excited about it. But it's not happening yet. Well, it's it's going to. I mean, we, it, you know, we just got someone there. I'm 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 encouraged. Thank you for your encouragement, Darcy. I appreciate that. Okay, so we can move on to HR the resolutions. Are we moving on to the resolutions? Yep. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Can I please have a motion and a second to approve Human Resources Memorandum 55A, certified and 55B, non-certified, dated March 15, 2022? Motion. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion carries. Can I please have a motion and a second for human resources item number 6.2, authorization to hire staff for Denzel Washington School of the Arts production of A Soldier's Play. Motion. Any questions, comments, or concerns? So every time they put on a play that there's a budget that's put in place for them to um, pull from, because you know, you're looking at some of the people who work there so you work there, and this is your job. But now, when the play comes up, new money's come out. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's like a coach, a, a football coach. Every game, you know, and when they make it to the playoffs, do they get more money? When they make it to the championship, do they get more money? It's like they're getting money to do things that they're supposed to do. No, but it, 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 but it, when, it's the same it's, as overtime for a teacher. Exactly. It's the same thing. I, I work in the school. I end at two twenty. You having a party at six o'clock? I'm getting paid for that joint. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. No, but it's and, like, then, and I understand where you're coming. If if I'm I'm the librarian of the school, anything that happens after two twenty, my time ends at two twenty. And yes, what is taking place at the school has to do with the school, but after two twenty, that is overtime. I don't That's know how if it goes I get in that. all all it goes like that in all all schools. I don't know if I get that. Um well this school was Sat you, this you teach if you teach on Saturday. No, I, I Saturday, hear what you're Canada. saying. It's not like I so, don't understand. Yeah, it. I got you, I got you. Yeah, I don't can I, get can it, I ask though. this question, Trustee Red? Is it that you feel that everything captured in this resolution you feel should be covered by what they do in their normal everyday duties? Absolutely. Okay, so that's the question. There's the differentiation between oh, their normal everyday duties that they're paid a salary for versus this particular budget for this particular special presentation. No. It's, 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 it's a separate thing. It's outside of okay. their everyday scope. Right. That's what this is about. It starts at 3.30, which our contract says 3.15 teachers. I totally understand. Okay, I but, just but, don't know if I, I get I'm, it. That's all. That's what I'm, I'm saying. with you. I'm, I'm with you. You're trying to correct me. I don't get it. That's all. Right, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm with you. Day, I don't during get the day, it during the, 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 the performance is after school. The performance I get that. is not embedded into the curriculum of the day. I get it, man. I get um, it. But then how am I going to go to lunch and prep? Trustee, I get you, the Trustee Reed, I'm because not that is yeah, one of. I'm sorry, read. Red. Sorry, Red. Red. My bad. Red. 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 Yeah. Um, because cool. I understand that there's some personnel here that are, for example, Harlan Penn. She's a teaching artist. Get it. Um, not supposed to mention. He. You know, I'm. Oh, sorry. My my my, my apologies. Um, uh -oh. okay. um however. 
when I heard Dr. Collins talk here and express her passion about the productions and express, you know, her passion about getting this done and setting the program up to the standards that she wanted to be. She also kept on saying, well, because I, am, I could be paid to running this production, I could be paid to running this production. What, if you're so passionate, number one, don't throw to my face or to our face that she could be paid someplace else to do something. That's number one. Christy, I, I think that should be a... a well, well the, the only thing that I'm saying is this. Most of this budget is going for her rate. And I understand that it's after school. Okay. I understand that it's after school. But we are right now, you know, talking about how can we fix schools. So can we all swallow the bullet? Okay. I understand where the street rate is growing. I get it. Okay, so it's we not have even a motion. True. It's not a majority. But we have it's a not, motion on it's the not floor. Not a Listen, volunteering... What do y'all? What do y'all talk? What What are y'all saying? We have a motion on the floor for this Let's resolution. It's over Where are we, Taylor? Yes. Yes. I. Comments. Okay. We're We're in comments. Okay. All right. In so I I can't. I mean, if I if I vote to approve overtime for curriculum, if I approve overtime for a science fair at Graham, Brother. if I approve overtime for whatever, it's how is this any different? It's the same. Thing. Okay, it's the same thing. It is the same thing. It is the same thing. Somebody's got to be there after school with the kids making it happen, or it's not going to happen. And if you want staff to be there after school hours, then you pay them. That's, that's how it works. Okay, so it's emotional. Even as much as you love it, mm -hmm. as much as you passionate. I'm passionate about books. I talk about reading all the time. But that clock hit 221. I'm clocking in, baby. The only people volunteering after hours, <laughs> no, the only people volunteering after hours is us. Okay. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, guys, let's move on. Let's move on. Gotcha. Take the vote. Oh, yep. Take let's the vote. Let's move on. Okay, so All there's a favor? motion on the floor. I am in favor. I'm aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Abstentions? I abstain. 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 Melissa and Adrian both abstaining. Motion carries. Yeah, no. Yeah, five two two. So we had two. I'm sorry. Do we have two no's and one abstain? Two, two abstain. And two abstentions. Yeah, two no's. Two no's. Two five. abstentions. Two two no's. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank next. You. Next. May I please have a motion and a second to approve human resources item number six point three authorization to pay staff for the international baccalaureate curriculum planning. Okay. Motion. motion second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Aye. Motion carries. Motion. <laughs> <laughs> Next, school improvement. Can I please have a motion? And a second to approve school improvement personnel memorandum P22-13, dated March 15th, 2022. Motion. Second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Motion carries. Can I please have a motion and a second to approve bus business office memorandum number 84, dated March 15th, 2022? Motion. Second. I have a question. This is on the 8.1. Correct. Um, so so we, ha we have money to complete 20 bathrooms at Denzel, Washington, Williams, and Parker. And this is going to cost how much? The five hundred, the one point two. The one point two million is the total cost of doing all the bathrooms at those three schools. Mm -hmm. Five hundred forty-seven thousand is coming from the Office of School Improvement through grants. We're asking the board to loan six hundred and what six hundred forty thousand, six hundred fifty thousand, to complete this project. July first, 
we will get another 547,000 towards this from the Office of School Improvement. That will leave $150,000. That 150 will come from the third year from the Office of School Improvement. Ultimately, there will be no cost to the taxpayers for this, but we, we do not have the money to advance to complete these bathrooms. So do well, we know how much the bathrooms cost? One point two million dollars is the. We already have specs for that. that those dollar. those those were specified. They were all bid. They were public bids. I just had two. Can I? Um, two follow-up questions. Um, just to clarify, you say we do have the funds to pay for them, and we're going to loan them to ourselves so that we can get reimbursed later. Yes, we're yeah. we're loaning the money to ourselves, and the Office of School Improvement will provide. Another 547,000 July 1, and then the balance of it the following July 1. Yes, we are loaning it to ourselves. Okay, but it, we're loaning it to ourselves as a bookkeeping matter so that we can then get reimbursed from the grant. Yes. I understand. Um, and what's the, what's the schedule for completion of this work? The Denzel Washington bathrooms are, are close to being completed. The uh, Parker bathrooms are underway, and the Williams bathrooms are about to start. Okay. We had to stop because we, we had to have the funding. Thanks. <coughs> Any, Any further questions? questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Can I please have a motion and a second to approve business office item number 8.2, authorization for Mount Vernon STEAM Academy to visit Winter for Kids in Vernon, New Jersey? Ma motion. Second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Have fun. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That's the father, though. Motion carries. Can I please have a motion and a second to approve business office item number 8.3, accept a donation for the Cecil H. Parker School pre-K moving up ceremony and eighth grade graduation? Aye. Second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Can I please have a motion and a second to approve business office item number 8.4, authorization to enter into a cost, enter into a cross contract with Eastern Suffolk BOCES? Motion. I have questions about this. Um, so I want to be clear, this is payment of an annual insurance premium to take care of which devices specifically? Is it ones that teachers and staff use or just students or both or what does this cover? Um, if you look at the, um, the attachment, it specifically outlines all the damages, all, all the devices, um, 8,796 in all. I'll also let you know, Trustee um, McGowan, that because it's a cross-county uh, BOCES contract, where it's 45% aidable as well. And in the past year, we've reclaimed over $70,000 um, from the devices as well. Um, it's, it's one of the things that go along with moving a district to a one-to-one where every student has a device and teacher has a device. No, I understand we, we have every student. Can you, when you say 70,000, I didn't understand. Can you clarify um, what you said? Up until I asked um, for an overview of what we've received to date before this resolution went up. And um, so the technology department um, provided me details of over $71,000 that we've received from insurance for, uh, regarding the claims that went in this year. And this year, is, a, is this on a school year basis or calendar no, year? The, right now, it, it expires um, March 26th. That's why it's in front of you tonight. Okay, so we're almost at the end of this. First year. Period, and this is the resolution to renew that insurance. Yeah, oh. keep, keep in mind, we have not been in school for a full year as well. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yep. Um, and was this put in place last year? Did we pay the yes, same it premium? It was. Or is it less? Uh, I believe it was approximately the same premium. All right. Shouldn't it be less if we're covering older equipment? Mm -hmm. uh, I could get you last year's contract. I don't have it in front of me. I mean, I... So I would, um, Trustee Patterson, it makes sense, yes, because there were less devices last year. 
So but, but again, so we're, so we, we're, this past year, let's assume we had the same amount. Maybe it was, maybe it's a little higher in premiums that we paid and we got back from that $71,000. Mm -hmm. so, right? Am yeah, so it's I a net of about 52000 as far as expense on year one. It could be more in year two. It could be less because you're talking about... How'd you about, get the 52? Um, I took the 45% of the 224 and I subtracted the 71 that we received. Right. So we lost like 50 grand roughly by insuring these devices over the last year. It's an estimate, it's an estimate. Yeah, and other districts um, have, um, in the past, in my experiences, they charge parents for the insurance also, but we, don't, we do not do that. Yeah, I understand. So that's where your expense is really different than other districts possible. And I understand. I'm sorry, just for my own edification, because I know you said 8,796 devices. Do we know what the value of those 8,796 devices is? Well, I, we're about, we're about, let's say we're, we're insuring, I don't know, a bajillion dollars for $250,000. Well, we, we purchase the devices and then of course, like anything, they depreciate. Yeah. Um, and when they're broken, we receive replacement or full replacements on the damages. So I don't know how to answer your question on what, what each device, each iPad, each Dell, Latitude, Do we know 31, give or take is. how much we spent day like day one to get these nine approximately nine thousand devices? Well, a lot of them were donated, but how much did we spend? To go, yeah, it would, I would have to do research on the IPA. Okay, because that would be, I think that would be a helpful number to say. Listen, we're spending two hundred thousand or two hundred and fifty today, but we're covering, I don't know, however, a million and a half dollars. Well, I'll, I'll follow up and get you that information. Perfect. Thank you. And I have one question too. I think it's about the the um, people who are doing the work who won the bids to do these um, bathrooms and schools. Now, who is responsible to make sure that they abide by the policy of the diversity, equity, inclusion? By the DEI policy. The DEI we'll policy. Make them all sign. So each of these contractors has to provide us with. Uh, payroll information about who they are employing, and that payroll information gives information that uh, provides us with what we need to know about the DEI. So there, there is identification information in the payroll records that they have to give us. So they must give us payroll records before, for every dollar that they spend for their people before they get any money from us. And so these contractors, as a matter of fact, the plumbing contractor uses almost all Mount Vernon residents. And they, they are uh, a, a DEI performer, as are all of these. Okay, cool. Thank you. But that's all checked by us. Okay. So 8.4 is still on the floor. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, op any opposed? Uh, I oppose. I oppose. Me too. <coughs> like to oppose? And Melissa? Be me. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Can I please have a motion and a second to approve Student Surf Services Memorandum Number 16, dated March 15, 2022? Motion. Second. Any questions, comments, and concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And I have a motion and a second to approve an authorization to enter into an agreement with the County of Westchester. That's 9.1, right? This is 12.1. Yeah, that's for the voting machines. Yes. Okay, motion. So yeah, yeah. Second. Who who is the motion? Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. Mike a second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? My only my only question is: Is this is, is it the same rate as last year? We I, I couldn't. Machines. Oh, we just borrow them. Yeah. We don't pay anything. Pay oh, it's be Even a better. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Westchester County. Abstentions. <laughs> Motion carries. Uh, I, 
Okay. I know it's late, but um, so the last election, the the election that uh, Jeff Red and myself were in, there was an issue with the ballots, uh, uh wrong. Uh, dates not 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 necessarily the date, but I know the wrong city was on there and things oh, of that nature. And also, yeah. uh, the other the other issue was that was during COVID, right? The 2020 yeah. election. Yeah. That yeah. was during COVID. I remember and, voting. Yes. There was and, a lot and, of uh, issues. Another thing that we had discussed as trustees was the fact that it was just so much information on that ballot. It was like you know you needed to at least sit down in the bathroom and <laughs> read. It. So. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that whoever's in charge of uh, creating this ballot, that the ballot isn't intimidating, because that ballot was very, very intimidating when Jeff Red and I were running. Thank you. No bathroom ballots. Who actually write? Do, do, do we write the ballots, or do the county write the ballots? We write the ballots. Okay. But we have to include the library. And I know we have to include the libraries. I know. Factor. Elmo on the library. <laughs> <laughs> it's already 10 30. Elmo on the library. A 12 1 is on the floor. No, we already we just voted on 12 yeah, 1. Yeah, we voted on it. Okay. Can I please have a motion and a second to authorize to change a school name? Second. second. Who I heard first. All in fa Oh, any questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, can, can you, I'm sorry, can you just remind me which of these is the first vote to change the name, which is the second vote? The first is Holmes. Holmes will become Mount Vernon Honor Academy. But that's, is that the same vote we took last meeting? Yeah, Holmes is the same. For Holmes, it's the same. Yes. The, the, naming, the, the actual name of the building doesn't uh, impact the resolution. The resolution is just to change the name of the building itself in general. It doesn't stick it to a name. Am I correct? Says the name. I'm just saying because the last time we voted, there was a different name for was, Columbus. So Karen. is this considered the first the vote name. for Columbus or the second? Well, let's get, let's, here. hang on. Let's do one at a time. <laughs> let's do one at a time. Okay. Holmes. So this, the current, this is 12.2, the, the, bil the building f currently known as Holmes right now. Correct. Right? Changing it to Mount Vernon Honor. And this is Correct. changing it to Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon Honor, Honor Academy. Academy. Honor Academy. Correct. Okay. I can take the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. And the next one. I have a motion and a second to authorize to change a school name. So clear it up. Motion. Second. And so this one is for Columbus. Mm -hmm. This is for Correct. Columbus. Columbus School changing to Mount Vernon Leadership Academy. Correct. And this and this will be the first one because we changed it was changed, right? We um, changed the change. Uh, the, this is different than the last time we voted on it, yes. So this will be last the time first I said one cares. for Columbus. So this one, so just so I'm understanding, since this is the first vote, it will not happen for this coming school year, right? Correct. Because oh, what's the deadline? The deadline today. is today. today. The deadline is today? It's okay. We can waive it. I, I, I don't know, see why we couldn't waive it. We can waive the second vote. Can we waive it? The board can vote. Or no, they can't. Is it a policy or is it a state? It's a, it's a law. No, it's a policy. It's oh. a board policy. And if it's a policy, we can waive our own policy. Waive it in this school. Let's waive it. I mean, we can close this meeting and have another one if you guys want. Let me make a suggestion. My suggestion to the clerk is to change the wording of the resolution and add a sentence that says, this shall serve as the second reading for this name change. All right? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Yay. Can I please have a <laughs> motion and a second to accept the minutes of the February 
2022 special meeting. Motion. Second. Got to be faster, Candace. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. So um, this is it. So we're going to go into executive. Oh, oh, we got one more. One more resolution. Oh, one more. <laughs> um, a motion and a second to accept the minutes of the March 3rd, 2022 motion. meeting. Second. I think, I think Jeff might have to. Any questions, comments, concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Mo motion carries. Um, I've just been advised that we will not be able to, Dr. BC just shared that we will not be able to get that name change in for this year. Which one? Either. Either. How come? Because it would have had to have been in early 3 p.m. Today. today. I should come on. Oh, they have to get it by close of business? Yeah. Is that correct, Dr. BC? Yes, it had to be in by 3 o'clock today. Uh, all right. Well, don't worry. well, they got all plan. the year to plan. plan for for yep. The signs done. Just start the planning from now. The yep. signs in next year's budget. Yep. Yeah. Well, and that, 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 that's just the official paperwork in Albany. You can do whatever you want. They can put up banners. We can do whatever we want at the actual building. It's just what does Albany refer to it as? Right. Okay, so, so um, does that um, finish all our... Oh, well, we have to do a motion in a second to enter executive session. Motion For the purpose... Go ahead. What? What happened? Go ahead. What? What's going on? Can... I have a motion and a second to enter executive session for the purposes of discussing the employment history of a particular person or persons, collective bargaining negotiations between the district and MVAG, and current tax litigation. If we say no, can we go home now? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> second. You can, Thank you can you. vote no, Melissa. You can vote no. <laughs> I'm going to assume everybody's in no favor. No one can stop you. Yep, favor. Yes. Motion carries. We don't have to. We don't have to. Motion to should we adjourn? Can we adjourn? We can do the we can do the action after I assume. Yeah. Excuse me. We won't be returning after exact. So.